started, I'll call our budget work session to order. Good to see everybody today. David, I know we got a long agenda, so I'll turn it over to you. All right. We're going to go through this. As everybody knows, this is our uh, budget work session to talk about the recommended fiscal year 2023 budget. We have four presentations uh, this morning, and then we can walk through a, a number of budget responses. So I won't take any more of the microphone. I'll turn it over to Val to introduce the fire staffing study. Val. Good morning, Mayor and Council, um, David, and thank you for allowing me to kick off the fire and EMS staffing and organizational review. Um, this, I think, probably deserves a little bit of fanfare. We talked about fire staffing as we were wrapping up fiscal year 22 budget discussions um, with a promise to y'all that we would work with a consultant to really do a deep dive and look at fire department staffing um, in an effort to be prepared for fiscal year 23 budget conversations. Um, and through a lot of work over the last couple of months um, with CityGate, who I'm going to introduce uh, the principal for CityGate, Mr. Stuart Gary, here in just a few minutes. Um, but we spent the last several months working intensely with the fire department, planning and data analytics, um, MedStar. We have Ken Simpson here from MedStar. Um, as we've really taken a deep dive at fire staffing and the services they provide. Um, you know, they have 963 sworn positions, 50 civilian positions. Um, right now they have 44 fire stations that they're providing services to residents, visitors, businesses all over the city. Um, and I'm excited to have Stuart come to the microphone. He'll give you a little bit of about, a little background on himself and his experience. Um, and then he'll walk you through a um, a, presenta or a presentation and detailing the final report that he provided. Um, I do apologize. I sent that out. We had worked with Stu to get that finalized and wrapped up so we could move on with today's um, workshop presentation. So I did distribute that to y'all late, late last night um, with some attachments. Um, but knowing that Stu would be here today to really walk you through the report, um, and then after this session, once you have a, a chance to read it, we can field additional questions with Stu. So with that, I'll turn it over to Stuart Gary to introduce himself and then provide the presentation. Thank you, Ms. Washington, Mayor, and members of the council. It really is a pleasure to be here today. Uh, I have a deep passion for this work, and I think you're also entitled to know briefly who the talking head is who's about to take you through a, a 50 slide deck deck quickly and informatively, but I think you need to know you don't just have an academic up here. You don't just have somebody who dabbles in fire and EMS business. I'm a bit of a unicorn. So I'm the public safety principal for CityGate Associates. CityGate only works for local government on behalf of the public, our clients. We don't work for the private sector. We're a virtual city hall who employs about to retire or recently retired annuitants who have a love for public administration, community, and giving back. I retired as a fire chief of department, and since retirement, I have affinity for you all. I've served as a city council member and a school board member dur president during the Great Recession when we laid off 200 teachers because the state wasn't giving us enough money. I've been on both sides of the table. I've been in closed sessions with briefings by experts by fire hose, pun intended, and feeling overwhelmed as a council member. You've received a 400-page study written by a team of fire and statistician and database experts. Myself, when I said I'm a unicorn, I'll date myself. I first walked in a fire station as a sophomore in high school in 1970 and was trained to be a firefighter because there weren't enough volunteer adults during the daytime. I was in the back of an ambulance by myself at age 17 with a Red Cross first aid card. I went to the first EMT class in San Diego County. I was in the fifth paramedic class in San Diego County. I've come up through the ranks with a bachelor and master's degree, retired as chief of department, and I've been successfully consulting now uh, for, uh, off the top of my head, 17 years. So yes, I'm getting older finally, <laughs> but I started as a youth, and you're gonna hear, I, I trust my passion for these issues. They are complicated, and today is about listening and asking questions. You've got to digest all the material. 
you're going to want staff to come back with implementation thinking. We'll talk about that at the end. But let's, let's take a tour through Fort Worth Fire Services. So the scope of work for us was to completely review uh, the fire and some of the EMS components of the system. Uh, there are top five fire and EMS takeaways and service delivery challenges we'll to discuss. We're going to talk about risks to be protected and outcome goals. I'll explain why in a moment. Then we're going to talk about service demand measures, response time performance, fire headquarters staffing. And I'll say this about three times today. The deployment of men and women on the ground doing the emergency service work can only occur if there's an adequate headquarters team to logistically supply, train, and provide quality of care oversight. And that includes mechanics putting fire tires on fire trucks. It includes training instructors. It includes business and IT people. That back office machine is rarely seen and almost never discussed at the policy level. And we've got some policy issues today to discuss about, about that. Recap of our findings, recommendations, and next steps. I'm going to use hopefully not a lot of terminology today. I don't define, but as you take the printout of the deck home and you see an acronym or a word, we've given some brief abbreviations here. For example, uh, ALS means paramedic, advanced life support. Uh, you'll also hear me talk about percent of goal measures, mathematical for term of that is a fractal, which is very different than average. Uh, we'll talk about uh, standard setting institutions. And in Texas, uh, you're unique, and I know you're unique for a lot of reasons, no pun intended, but you're one of the few states in the United States by statutory authority has established the Texas Commission on Fire Protection, and TCFP issues a whole sort of statutory regulations governing the provision of fire services, the quality, the training, the equipment of fire services. So we'll talk about turnout time and different issues of response time and what a first and multiple unit arrival is. So our scope was to do that deep dive fire EMS staffing study, a comprehensive review of effectiveness and efficiency to review the integration with MedStar's delivery of paramedic ambulance service. And I've already described who our, our, our firm is and pun intended here, not, not our first rodeo. And we feel honored to have been given a job of this size, frankly. And also you're one of three large jobs right now. Currently city of Los Angeles is a client, city of Portland is a client and I brief for the final time the Portland Commission next Tuesday via Zoom. So we are used to big complicated data sets. We also do one horse, all volunteer fire departments and everything in between, mostly in the Western states. How we did the work, we received almost two gigabytes of electronic and paper data from the city. We conducted internal and external stakeholder interviews. We did a comprehensive community risk assessment. I'll lead off with that in a moment a very deep, uh, repetitive dive on incident statistics to get to response times, types of calls, locations of calls, uh, peak calls at peak hour of the day. Do you have enough resources when it's high tide for 911 demand for service? GIS travel time analysis, where should fire stations be located, the headquarters staffing, multiple progress briefings, interactions with staff yielding a 400-page document. I remind all of my client councils, and, and most know this, but especially for the public listening at home, uh, there are no federal or state laws governing in the United States the minimum provision of fire and EMS services. It's a home rule, local control issue, period. Uh, many states, if they have any requirement at all, just direct cities to provide for it, but don't say at what level. Therefore, the level of fire and EMS services provided is a local policy decision. You have the level of service you can fund, and it may not always be what you desire. There's a constructive tension, more so since the Great Recession, and all my clients, where we want this level of service, but how do we pay for it? We get, we get that. The overall positives, I can't stress this enough. Sometimes you come in to do a performance audit, a deep dive review, there's friction, there's pushback, not in Fort Worth. Very committed staff in every agency, there was complete candor and data transparency. Your teams are focused, and I include MedStar in this too, training and employee health. The skills are technically competent. I don't want the public today to have a takeaway just because there's things to work on. These are agencies performing at the highest level they can, giving excellent customer service day in and day out. They're strained. They're stressed in spots, and we're going to talk about in an improvement sense what improvement can look like and stability in some aspects looks like. I don't want anybody, hopefully even a reporter listening, 
These are not broken agencies in need of an immediate overhaul. Take this as a best practices tune-up, and they've been extraordinarily forthcoming with data and assistance and discovery to us. So what are the top five challenges before I start to define them for you? Growth in the North City and along almost all outer edge area are straining effective delivery of fire station response times. First paramedic delivery, given Par MedStar's paramedic ambulance response times and ability uh, and, and their service delivery revenue structure. Lengthy dispatch processing times, given the interplay of three dispatch centers. We'll talk more about that in a moment. Now that Lincoln's customer service before the first wheels even start rolling. The need for specific outcome-driven goals, in my opinion, by this city council to drive the future investment and deployment of fire services. And we're going to talk about how you set those goals and how you can have a very clear policy role in setting customer service delivery. And then we'll talk about fire headquarters staffing, uh, budgeting for overtime, the fiscals, et cetera. Take a breath and say, okay, Stu, you just said goal setting. Well, I'm a council member. I don't know anything about emergency service setting goals. What do you base goal setting on? Risks to be protected. Think about fire service deployment as calculating the whole machine backwards from what you want your customer to receive after they've called 911. We're going to talk about what those deliverables are. But once you all say, by policy, here's the fire and life-saving end-game customer service point, we and your staff calculate everything backwards from the moment of 911 saying hello, and even Tarrant County 911, right, has a hand in this, the entire machine has to perform with exquisite precision every time somebody calls for help. But you got to define the end game. If you want lazy response times, if you want half as many fire stations, that's a, that's a political policy choice. So the risks to be protected for those desired outcomes. Most of our urban clients, in simple terms, would say, well, what's an outcome? Number one, prevent permanent, permanent impairment from medical emergencies where possible. I'm injured, I'm ill, 911 come help stabilize me, get me to definitive care, return me to a successful quality of life. Are some people already sadly perishing as 911 is being called? Of course. But the system is also designed to save those still in need of acute care to get the care they need and move to a destination facility. Most of my clients also expect building fires to be confined to the room or compartment of origin, right? You don't want to burn out the whole floor of a high rise. You don't want a single family home fire in a 1950s neighborhood to spread to four properties. Ideally, you'd even say some of the personal possessions in the business or of the homeowner. Delivering those outcomes depends on adequate staffing, apparatus types, and response times over the geography. If you remember nothing else today about fire service deployment, I'm going to give you maps and stats, and you're going to, you're going to go, wow, where am I 30 minutes from now? Remember these two things. Fire service deployment, as is paramedics in a slightly different sense, is about the speed and the weight of the attack. Speed is a single first responder, neighborhood-based, to get to modest emergencies quickly and to completely handle the emergency with one fire crew and an ambulance, if, if as needed. The weight of the attack, though, is important for fire station spacing across the geography, because when really serious fires happen, I have to bring enough crews together quickly enough to get enough boots on the ground to simultaneously and effectively stop that serious fire from becoming catastrophic and going to greater alarms. And my analogy to you all there is like playing football. If I don't get enough people on the ground, can I play 11 versus 6 in football? Well, yeah, but what's going to happen to the 6 who showed up short? And in my business, if you show up too long, too short a crew, fire wins. EMS tragedies occur. Timing is everything in this business if it's really becoming an acute emergency. And yes, everybody will tell you we don't have a lot of those. And I would argue an equitable position is I want every neighborhood to have equitable access to emergency care. And we're not going to say, well, statistically, it doesn't happen that often. Therefore, we really don't care about acute care. We're going to do this homogenous, uh, different level of care. You're going to hear me with passion argue for equitable neighborhood service delivery. And I would say that whether you're elected by a district or there's just five of you elected city at large, I think we all care as public servants about the equity of access uh, to our societies. 
You also deliver the weight of attack that multiple people with specialty units, such as ladder trucks, engines, hazmat, water rescue vehicles, as of just a couple of days ago, for example. It's not just about fire engines and ladder trucks. So risk assessment, we cut the city into zones, fire station first two districts. We've counted the values at risk. We'll describe those in a moment. We look at the probability and in your prior incident data, how often you go to those risks. We multiply consequence and impact and we come up with a score by fire station area. So that helps us start to understand, in a simplistic sense, is this all single family housing? Is it dense multifamily housing and, and business district commercial? Is it industrial R&D warehouse? Is it aviation? Because some of our specialty response teams and time over distance varies by hazard category. So as you start to set a council level policy, we have to tune the system to the actual risks on the dirt. So real quick, you know these numbers. People, uh, you've cracked 900,000. You're headed to over a million people. You've become the 13th largest city in the United States, and you're not stopped growing. You've already got 350,000 residential housing units, 275 critical facilities. Those are the things to be protected that are essential to modern society functioning. Water, wastewater, power, telecommunication nodes, healthcare facilities, things that modern urban society can't run for very many days, right? The Great Freeze. <laughs> things break really quickly if society's infrastructure and public safety teams can't keep the, the business of society running. You've also got another 1,100 maximum high-risk occupancies, hospital, healthcare, mega inst educational institutions. Economic resources. You've got over 27,000 businesses, over 300,000, almost 400,000 employees. So you talk about in and out migration populations, which we have to in my business. Well, when do calls for service peak? Diverse, robust economy, numerous cultural, historic, and natural resources. So now let's talk about time. Well, Stu, you talked about risks, and you talked about keep the fire to the room of origin, and you talked about medical survivability. How do we put that into words? Well, coincidentally, there are two timelines that diverge at the same moment in time. So the left-hand chart, for those of you at the table, is brain survival when the brain stops getting enough oxygen. So time zero on the left, and, and you're alive and perfusing your brain, in four to six minutes without oxygen, the brain starts to die. Most will say brain death comes ir irreversible at minute eight to 10. If you're not perfusing your brain, and I wanna be clear on two things, it's not a heart stoppage. It could be a heart irregularity, it could be breathing complications, it could be things paramedics can intervene on to help stabilize you and get you to the hospital. It's not always, oh my gosh, the classic TV episode, crushing chest pain, I fall over dead, and that's it. But that first responder needs to get there about minute eight or nine from 911 saying hello. And as I walk you through travel time and station spacing, that's a tough challenge. Eight minutes goes by really quick, really quick. Coincidentally, on the right side is what's called the time temperature curve. At minute zero, fire ignites in open flame in a room. So a fire can, one of these overstuffed chairs back here could smolder for three hours in the middle of the night. Once it breaks into open flame, fire doubles in growth every minute. The fire doubles. And in a room, a compartment, Fire by about minute eight goes to what we call the flashover point where the entire room has reached ignition temperature. Everything's gonna burst into flame at once. You now have a vicious fire that's gonna chew its way out of the room into the rest of the building. So coincidentally, you want your fire and EMS first responders there in less than 10 minutes if you expect to keep small things small. And if they arrive later with fewer people, even on the multi-unit first alarm, you're fighting this running clock. Okay, let's talk about service demand. Uh, we pulled four years of incident data for the fire department. Uh, the red bars on the bottom are the percent of fires. Uh, Good News America, since uh, the early 1970s and a couple of famous federal studies, America's turned a corner on suppressing building fires. We were much better off than we were when I started my career. The blue bar is EMS, however, the fire service and also the ambulance industry have increasingly become the healthcare of only resort. As healthcare in America, has failed to get equitable access to everybody. Yes, I'm on my soapbox for a minute. But EMS is on the receiving end. If I don't have preventative health care, 
If I don't have any access to health care, my only choice is to call 911. And someone's going to come make my bad day better if I call 911. Well, that's resulted in a tsunami of EMS work for America's fire and ambulance operations. The, the other bars are other, water rescue, tech rescue, hazmat, other necessary fire service responses. So if you look at time of day, midnight on the left, midnight on the right, sometimes my clients, especially smaller cities, say, well, can't I just turn off some of my fire stations at night to save money? No, this is 3 a.m. In four years, low tide demand for service continues after midnight. It accelerates with early morning rush hour, people waking up. You hit the shoulder of the day, and you have high demand for service, and then it starts to taper off late evening. Some of that's climate, recreation, daylight dependent. If I showed you Minnesota data, it looks a little different, but pretty much this same curve exists everywhere in America except Clark County, Nevada on the Strip. And yes, emergency incident demand on the Strip looks radically different than this curve. But you're you and you're normal. This is, but we have to, at peak hours of the day, we need to understand, do you have enough units for simultaneous calls? I don't have a simultaneous demand problem at 3 a.m., but I sure do at 2 in the afternoon. We'll talk about that in a second. So this is a very complicated table. It's well written in the report. This is the percent of each hour in 12 months. So let's look at uh, 1 p.m., 1,300 for engine 29. In that hour, in one year, they spend 24% of their time logged into an open incident. Logged into an open incident. That's not refueling. That's not cleaning. That's not a comfort break. That's not a meal break. They're logged into an active incident 25% of the hour. Well, we look for runs over time of when that hits 30% and goes hour after hour after hour. If you're 30% logged into active incidents, five, seven hours running, you're not taking care of the other necessities of maintaining the equipment, checkout, report writing, getting a meal break. There, just, there is a threshold there to where you just can't go call to call to call and deliver quality of care, and no one in here listening would want to be at the receiving end of either an ambulance or a firefighter or paramedic after they've run 17 calls in a row. What do you think the quality of care you know, is at that point? They're struggling right, to deliver the best customer service possible, but they're tired. We're all humans. And at some point, uh, you can only do so much physically in a row. So we've analyzed that in the study. None of your units are close to 30 at all today, much less, nor are they close hour after hour. But the takeaway is, at peak hours of the day, and these are not the high, busiest engines in the city by total volume, some of the engines have more calls in 24-7, 365. But at peak hours of the day, I'm telling staff, put a yellow light on and start watching this. And we'll talk about some mitigation strategies in a moment. Now, I mentioned simultaneous calls. Very important. Well, in Fort Worth, as in most cities, you're divided into battalions, which are groups of fire station areas. Most of the simultaneous lightning strikes peak hour of the day occur in just two battalions. So as we start to look at those unit workload measures, we then look at the geography to say how many simultaneous hits are we occurring. And do I have enough troops on duty to maintain people going to calls and still have something in reserve for the next set of calls? Let's look at response time performance. So the best practices uh, between CityGate and other publications in the United States, I want you to think about response time as more than just drive time. I don't want you to even think about it as an average, and I'll explain why in a couple of slides. Our commitment to response time is total customer service. It begins with 911 saying hello, and it ends with wheel stop at the curb of the first needed unit. And I didn't say at the patient's side, I said wheel stop at the address. In many times, they still have to access where the patients, where the fire's difficult to get to. Best practices for call processing would be to get from hello to alerting the crew in a minute 30. Crew turnout take no more than two minutes when measured 24 hours a day. Ideally, waking hours would be closer to 90 seconds. First do travel. The drive time, once I'm alerted, got the proper protective clothing on, I'm seated and seat belted, and the unit's rolling. I just said all of those intentionally because they're safety laws. Firefighters have stopped hanging on the rig. 
putting on their coat like they do in Hollywood on the way to the call, hanging on with one arm. No, no, and no. They got the proper protective equipment on, they're seated, they're seat belted, they're rolling. Driving time's about four minutes. So if you add those components together, a first unit call to arrival goal is seven minutes and 30 seconds. A little better than that eight and nine-ish minutes I was mentioning on the two curve graphs. First alarm, multiple units, you want the last due multiple unit to have about eight minutes driving time. So if I do four engines, two ladder trucks, and two chiefs to a building fire, the last assigned unit has eight minutes to get there. Some, are, some may get there in two minutes. It's around the corner from the first firehouse, right? But the weight of attack has up to eight minutes to get there. So how are we doing? Now I'm gonna go through three sets of numbers today, so bear with me, I'm sorry. This is now the difficult part of the slide deck. Fort Worth Fire Department's performance, just fire's performance, not 911 answering yet, not MedStar, to the, just the fire and EMS emergencies, not that other gold bar, fire and EMS, to 90% of the caseload in 2021, call processing took a minute 32. Fire dispatch is only two seconds over national uh, expectations, that's statistical dust. Fire dispatch, once they get the call, gets it executed into the crews. Crew turnout is three minutes, largely due to COVID sluggishness. I've talked to the staff about this. Uh, COVID caused extra PPE and precautionary things to happen. Um, things drifted. Uh, but they can drift right back with corrective data and focus by the management team and the crews on, to get crew turnout back to where it needs to be. First due travel, however, is difficult. Six minutes and 33 seconds. Whoa, 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 wait a minute. Chief Gary, you just argued 10 slides ago National expectations are four minutes. Yeah, they are. On a flat street, right angle grid street network with great spacing spaces to great station spacing. You've got diverse topo topographies, curvilinear road networks. You've done, in some cases, not your council's fault, but what I call as an analyst, leapfrog annexations. You got fingers and holes, and Fort Worth just kind of sprawls over, over the last century or 50 years. So 633 for travel is a challenge. We'll dissect that. You're two and a half minutes uh, long there. So your first unit call to arrival from fire dispatch being notified uh, in that year was 1021. Fire had a prior budget published goal of 624. That did not include fire dispatch time. That was only turnout and travel. So I'm going to recommend adopting a more comprehensive set of uh, performance requirements. And then first alarm travel for that last due unit is 18 and 21 minutes. That's reflective that you're so big and the station spacing in areas is so thin, the multiple units can't all get there quickly. And that differs by, by geography of the city. Now let's talk about average versus fractal real quick. A lot of agencies will still use the term average. Well, we get there in an average of eight minutes. Hey, Chief Gary, you said eight minutes on, on the time temperature curve is right in the norm. Average is the middle of a data set. If this were a normal bell-shaped cur distribution curve, if my average was four minutes, right, from zero at eight minutes, I'm done. This is a right-shifted curve. It's lopsided. Why? Because I'm only getting at four minutes to 60-some percent of the calls. At the fifth minute, I'm getting to more calls. To get to 90% of the calls citywide is taking 633 in travel. Why? Because in the outer areas or in the core inside the loop did simultaneous calls, the first due unit's not available. So the second due unit has to drive further to pick up engine three's call because they're already on a medical. All of that combines to work against you in Fort Worth. The spacing, the topography, the open space areas, the nature preserves, the water bodies, the highways, it all constrains the fast, oops, the fast movement of fire trucks. Okay, now let's look at dispatch by center. So police gets the call and has to transfer a fire or EMS call to one of two other dispatch centers, MedStar or fire. Police, over three years, to 90% of the fire and EMS calls, took two minutes and 42 seconds to get to 90%. Yes, they're transferring some calls quickly, 
police data analysts agreed with us with the data we pulled was good, but to get to 90% of the transferred calls is taking over two minutes. They're asking too many police-centric questions, in our opinion, before saying go to MedStar or FIRE. That has to be rectified. MedStar has to do, wants to do, is best practices to do what is called medical priority processing. They want to interrogate the caller a bit more because maybe they don't need a paramedic ambulance. Or they don't need an ambulance in eight minutes, they need an ambulance in 20 minutes. It's a low acuity event. However, that processing takes time. They spent to the 90th percentile of 213, they're in the left column. Uh, their numbers have gotten better post-COVID. Uh, they've shared, been very transparent, shared all our numbers with us multiple times. We and their data analysts have agreed on the numbers. And MedStar is getting better in call processing of late. I'll also say later they want to redo the priority one tier, and I support that. But historically, they took uh, the two minutes plus. So if a caller was to be really questioned to the nth degree by three comm centers, the comm center performance before a unit was notified could take anywhere from three to six minutes. Best practices, two minutes. Police needs about 30 seconds to say, not my issue, and get it to MedStar or FIRE. And then MedStar and FIRE got to quickly go, is this life threatening? I need to get units rolling, and I'll play the rest of the questions later, because in the next 90 seconds, if I learn different, I can always de-escalate the response. I could send a different unit type four minutes in. But if it sounds bad, better to start the movement of the people to the incident. Uh, well, somehow in this deck, the slide got sideways, my apology. Up here on the right, should be on top, this is a caller saying to 911, what's my problem? Your three comm centers are electronically linked. This is the decision three, three pathway. A caller has to navigate through three comm centers before its wheels rolling. I'm just saying at a very simple level, there is dead air in there, no pun intended, to process and prove and get acute calls out faster. And by the way, I'm not criticizing police because they've got a vital role times two. Is it life-threatening to them? Do they need a cop? They need to listen and continue to process their information. Also, we've looked at the daily logs. We haven't listened to dispatch tapes here, but if you look at the daily logs, their challenge out of a tsunami of non-emergency calls is to hear this one's life-threatening, I gotta do different. That is, that is an art form, learned, acquired skill. It can be honed, practiced with uh, feedback and quality control and tape listening. Uh, they can get better, but I don't want to say they're, they're just indifferent. They've got a tsunami of workload coming in, and they're looking for the needle in the haystack. MedStar and FIRE have half a tsunami coming in. Most of what comes to FIRE, and these centers are electronically linked. So when police says go to MedStar, it pops up on MedStar's computer screen. That's the good news. But then the continuing question happens. And then MedStar gives it to FIRE. FIRE's got to do something and, and kick it. To FIRE's credit, there's a uh, long story short, I'm going to say it now. I said I wouldn't. Roll around. In COVID, when police was busy, started to institute, if a 911 caller couldn't get answered quickly enough, it rolled to FIRE dispatch. So FIRE dispatch and their 90% performance they're getting a couple of hundred first 911 calls a day. They're able to triage the call and kick it back to police and fire quickly. I think G Gina has a question. Go ahead, Gina. My, my question to you regarding MedStar and the, uh, I guess, the, the way the questioning takes place, we know that this is not unique to Fort Worth, and we know that people have lost lives. Do you know what solves it? Yes. Yes. And... Let me address it a bit more later. It's an exquisitely good question. And, and succinctly right now, their listening process for what they call top priority is too fat. It's too big. Quantitatively, they've already done the clinical research based on actual patient cases to narrow that to a smaller subset to retrain everybody to say, when we hear these, cue, these emergent cues, it's everybody go. So they've done the clinical research. It's still being socialized within their committee and board structure. It's not deployed yet. But the good news is the research is done. 
and they have an act, leadership has an active interest to hone that smaller and retrain everybody to say, let's focus on what we've learned tends to be clinically really acute. So MedStar, which actually leads now to MedStar, they deploy a variety of units. They deploy ambulances with one paramedic and one EMT, which is not a paramedic. That's all explained in the report. Sometimes basic ambulances that only have two EMTs. They also have units that are critical care paramedics that transfer critical patients between healthcare facilities. It's not 911 system business, but they have subscribers who say, I need to move a patient to the cardiac cath lab at the hospital, you know, 10 blocks away. And you, the only way to do it's an ambulance uh, with a nurse and or a paramedic. They have supervisors. Uh, they're a new federally sponsored program. They're working on mobile integrated health. The houseless, uh, some of the street mental health issues don't need an ambulance, but they need a caregiver team. And they're part of your work with both police and fire and the HOPE team and the mental health emerging programs in America, and you're doing it too, to get some of the non-urgent stuff handled by not police, fire, and even MedStar resources. But MedStar's fielding some teams for that, especially at peak hours of the day. But when a call comes in, they blend all of these resources together. They don't set aside a group of ambulances only for 911. So if an ambulance is in downtown in, in its first due district in the loop and a hospital uh, makes a case for an urgent uh, transfer, the closest ambulance or the third due ambulance might take it. Well, then if bad luck strikes and lightning hits, a 911 call comes in, then MedStar tries to get a paramedic there to stop the clock. It may not be an ambulance, so when they talk about time to first paramedic, they've got multiple tools they are deploying. Their uh, board a few years ago adopted a performance metric of priority one at 11 minutes, 85% of the time. Uh, thought my head it was 2016, it's in the report. I, I shouldn't spitball a number, but I think it was 26, Ken, shake your head. Yeah, I'm sorry. 2016, thank you. Um, 400 pages, I don't pretend I've memorized every last factoid. Their performance over the years ranged from 73 to 84%. It was a little uh, uh, less than desired pre-COVID. COVID whacked everybody for different reasons in terms of street travel time, or response time performance. And their averages, which they also reported, were anywhere from a little over eight to nine minutes. And that's my and the best practices problem with averages in public safety in the United States it's just saying, well, the middle of the data says I'm there in eight minutes. Isn't that good enough? Well, do you want to be the data set that got, was received care five minutes longer than average? So you need to ask, what's past average? We'll talk about that. So a MedStar's priority one response times from MedStar dispatch without police, from MedStar only receiving the call, their dispatch processing pre-COVID was a minute 23, the best practices got sluggish during and post-COVID. It's crept up in our data years to over two minutes. I've seen some of MedStar's most recent data, not officially as part of this study, and their priority dispatching is getting back down again. Crew turnouts, infinitesimal because they're already on the streets in the ambulances. Takes about 30 seconds, stop what I'm doing, get moving with my ambulance. But their travel time to 90% of the priority ones uh, runs right around 10 to 11 minutes. Travel time. You add 90 seconds for dispatch, add 30 seconds for turnout, then add police 911 processing. That could be really short or really long. All of a sudden, MedStar is not getting there from call to arrival till about the 12th to 14th minute. More on that in a moment. Uh, before we move on, I have a question about, sure. or more of a comment about that. Um, I know that MedStar has a system performance committee, right? And you mentioned the data back in 2016, and, that, and that's accurate. Uh, that uh, system performance committee is being, um, right now we're looking for candidates to populate that, okay? At the time, that committee recommended taking the approach of using averages instead of, in, in your case here, the data to 2%, uh, using 90th percentile data. Um, Again, just an observation, but I think that's something that the new system performance committee could look at so that we can have more of an apples and oranges comparison. You provided some insight there, right? But at least the available MedStar numbers are not all 
you know, calculated that way. So it just kind of makes it a little difficult to. Yes, and, and their follow. official board policy was to report public facing, average, internally facing, fractal percent performance. Mm -hmm. And sometimes over the years, people, you know, bureaucracies make different decisions how to report the data, and it doesn't always scratch everybody's best practice pre preference. So uh, they've also, and I'll speak for Mr. Simpson here, he can certainly speak for himself uh, if necessary later, they have shown keen interest in this study. We redid a deep data dive with this data analyst and my analyst and myself. And we, we re-scrubbed the data, we got to yes on the data, and they have shown great inquisitiveness and have openly asked for some coaching on how we assembled the fractal performance numbers and how to turn a page to that best practice. Uh, and he can verify for that. That's, that's at least leadership's uh, uh, a request and uh, have grown as part of this, this, this study. Great. Thank you. But now back to fractal. You ought to be asking yourselves, well, that's 90%. What's the 10% we missed? So as a hypothetical, not all of these were acute because I've already said the P1 bucket's too big, but in the four years of data, they were compliant 78% of the time at minute 11. So that's 103,000 incidents that they were past minute 11. If you look at the ones that were past minute 11, it's 21,000 or about 18 a day about 18 a day over four years for P1, priority ones, were gotten to past minute 11. Now, it's a deeper dive to say, was it 1101 or was it minute 14? And, how, and, and did we get to 88% by minute 12? And it was just that last two minutes of a few calls in the most outermost edge of Fort Worth. The flip side is, we were caught out of ambulances downtown due to a confluence of demand. And yeah, we, we, got, we got there too slowly because any system at some points can run low on resources, especially ambulance systems, and more on that economically uh, in a minute. So we analysts say, who's missed the target? Where do they live? How acute were, we, were they? And does that demand an increase in performance? So let's talk about mapping briefly. Uh, computers are marvelous things nowadays when they work right. Uh, in the, in the, not the sideways slide. In this case, this is four minute driving time from the existing fire stations. Four minute driving time over your road network at speeds fire trucks can accomplish. Long story short. Fairly accurate map, plus or minus a couple hundred yards. This is what four minutes covers, and you have gaps in the system. Now, this scale of map, especially for those on video at home, you can't quite see the street network. Some of those gaps have no streets in them. They're not developed yet. They're, they're open space, future growth areas. But four minutes, especially out in the, in the newer, I'll just loosely say newer areas, four minutes is a challenge. Let's look at the addition of just two stations. Station 45 is programmed, it's under construction, can open this fall with at least the first crew. 46 is, the land is bought, not yet in design. So just plugging in those two stations improves up there and down here, we still have some other gaps. Most of my clients then say, well, if we can tune down, shorten dispatch and turnout, what does five minutes look like? And I've been asked this question endlessly. What's the economic efficiency difference between four and five minutes of travel? Well, here it is. If I turn on five-minute travel, look at the improvement. Four minute, five minute. So in your topography and road network, we've suggested, you don't have to adopt, physically spacing fire stations based on five-minute travel. And then we're going to talk about growth triggers and what drives the need for extra stations and a few more slides. Yes, Thank Alan. Yeah, go ahead. So, I mean, what's five minutes based on? It's not NFPA or OSHA. Right. So where does that come from and how does that reconcile? So it reconciles by, if you choose, to, to use it for spacing. If I want to get there by minute eight-ish something, if I can lock down dispatch to 90 seconds to two minutes, if I can lock turnout time, especially daytime, to 90 seconds, two minutes, 
uh, uh, nighttime hours. We're working in from the ends. We want to arrive by here. We lose this much before we start driving. I have the physical time there to space at five minutes. And five minutes works more for curvilinear streets, and it's very costly. And I, and I describe it briefly like this. It's very economically efficient to serve the palm of my hand. I can push out into my fingers some of those annexation strips with a station and possibly economically buy 25, 50, 75 miles of new road coverage within four or five minutes. But as I approach my fingertips, I've done this for clients, they'll say, show me what 10 more stations looks like. And by the time we get past the three or four really effective stations, they're spending in some clients' cases, two million a year in operating to add five to eight more road miles in 60 more seconds. So what we try to calibrate in the statistics in the report, what percent of the public streets do you cover today? What added stations can value add to that? And you're trying to strike a balance for physical spacing. And sometimes the road network allows you to get to calls in three minutes, sometimes it's six minutes. And, and any impact to ISO rating? The impact to ISO in this state has to be taken into, into consideration. We don't give it great deference because the way insurance premiums are actually underwritten, it's based not only on the fire department classification, but the risk types of the properties. And their individual properties in most states can get premiums based on their risk, not just the fire department score. So said this way, I could be a suburban community with a class three fire department, but I'm... Um, uh, I don't want to pick on a big box name, but I'm a big box retailer across the United States, and I've got a tilled up building with a sprinkler system, employees in it 24 hours a day because I'm either open for sale or I'm restocking. And the insurance industry says that's a pretty safe building. We'll give you a class one or two premium. So there's a lot more to just that fire score being the only thing to look at, and depending on the state and the zip codes, Fire protection as a percent of your total homeowner premium dollar has fallen over the years to be less than 25%. That industry pays more in other perils than they do to fire insurance. So there's a lot of moving parts there. It does need to be taken into consideration, especially given the statutes of Texas. Uh, and you certainly don't have to adopt five minutes. I'm trying to just make the business case that 60 more seconds, if you can get the other parts short, shorter, maybe the brick and mortar spacing could be a bit more elastic. And then maybe it's four and a half. Gina, so, go, ahead. go ahead, after, after Alan, Gina. So just to, to summarize, it potentially impacts ISO, but the risk to uh, residents and businesses may be mitigated by other factors. Correct. Correct. So it's, it needs to be researched past this point, uh, uh, how, how stridently will or won't they, they care. Uh, and they've also started to adopt this, not started, ISO has adopted nationally this methodology for looking at fire department performance. They, they finally got away from the fixed, how many fire hydrants are covered within a mile and a half distance of a fire station. They did that for more than several decades. So let's keep going. This is well, the- no, 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 I have, have a question. Sorry. Uh, I appreciate the hypothetical, and I appreciate you expressing it as that, but I hope the chief and Val and if everybody in here with a uniform for fire was listening to that five-minute discussion in terms of that, that component, because I'm going to need you guys to make that relatable to me so I can become an advocate for it. Right now, it's just very, very remote and distant and technical, as it's supposed to be. But you're trying to get us to say five five minutes spacing is good. You, you're going to have to show me how it's streets that I know and all that stuff. So hope you all were listening. They, they, they will. Thank you very much, Council Member. And, and I'll say this at the end, but also interject now. You've got outside advice, not the chief, not certainly not all of you and the city management team. Uh, you need to refine those recommendations, and they need to be brought back to Council for cons policy consideration. Today's a workshop. You're listening. You're asking questions. 
I certainly, most of my clients at this first review of so much technical information don't immediately make policy decisions. They ask for, for feedback exactly like you just did. Mm -hmm. I want to know more on this issues. We're all listening for that so we know how to refine the research. So when they bring you back a final response time recommendation for policy discussion, they can explain the moving parts. I've, I've been here since 2013. I'm very familiar with how this works. I just need them to make sure that they know how to explain this to me. Thank you. Leonard. Uh, just a quick question on the assumptions behind the minute travel time. Mm -hmm. Is that just distance and speed? Or it's speed. So, so, it, so it's, it's time over distance. It's a different equation than, than what is a mile and a half distance stop at versus my velocity, I'm, I'm a moving thing over the road network, how far can I likely reach in four to five minutes of movement? Okay. And I'm oversimplifying the math involved in that yeah. because velocity is not constant from I'm going to my brakes are stopped at the curb okay. and there's other interplay, but the computer understands the grid, the road network, the posted speed limits. We have also done, I didn't talk about it today because it's a de minimis impact here, we also get traffic congestion data, oh, that was my and next we question. run a separate model with congestion data. It's in the report. Congestion in most of your neighborhoods is a de minimis impact. Okay. You lose a couple of percentage points, not, not worth redeploying. But I have other clients at peak rush hour, they're losing 15 to 25% of their reach due to traffic congestion. It's a profound impact. Yeah. And I'm not in this executive summary today. I just chose not to include it. Thank you. Uh, j just one final question. I think it's maybe similar to Leonard's, and I'm trying to wrap my head around this uh, five-minute metric. Did you not say that that five-minute metric is is helped by the presence of curvilinear streets? It, it takes into it, it takes into the factor that that's what you're driving over. Okay. So said this way, if you adopt four minutes in some of these neighborhoods. Unless you can afford to put fire stations every about 1.75 distance miles apart, you'll never hit four minutes, 80 plus percent. You're setting yourself up for an unattainable goal, and then you have to ask yourself, are our fire severity and, and EMS severity worth the 60 seconds to almost double in some neighborhoods the spacing of fire stations? I could, I could name some of my urban clients that are successful somewhat close to four minutes. Their downtown flat cities, right angle road network, can almost see the other fire station. So a lot of the national discussion over the last 20 years on four minutes was become, we have an end game, we have a hello game, what was left in the middle? Not a lot of science went into it's four versus five. It just was the number left in the middle 20 years ago when they started talking about dispatch and turnout and customer survival. So there, if we want them there at seven and a half, seven minutes, uh, four minutes became the de facto drive time. And, and I have not encountered outside of a few, uh, outside of densely populated urban cities with older really good fire station spacing. Most metros your size, uh, in terms of percent of total road miles coverage, you, you'll struggle to get into the high 70th, 80th percentile of the public streets covered in four minutes. And, and you'll never get there because of my tip of the finger analogy, up in some of these edge area neighborhoods, you just don't have a lot of street. And, and 40s here has to wind and wander to get to uh, some of these, some of these uh, dead end locations. Now, could you set a policy of four minute spacing to to seventy five percent of the streets? You could. I, I'm recommending you consider four versus five, and consider a policy for the spacing of future fire stations. I'm going to go into those specifics in a few more slides. I have a couple of questions about the four versus five. The slide that you showed us earlier that gave us the 10-minute window that we want a response in, right? And eight minutes was our breaking point for when a fire becomes manageable Serious, versus maybe less manageable, to put it in lay terms. Um, how does that, one, how does this five-minute impact 
that um, that overall sequence that you that you showed us earlier was because when you walked us through that, it sounded like, well, we needed that four minutes because you've got a minute for dispatch, you've got a, you know, 30 to 90 seconds for our fire department to gear up and get on the truck and, you know, hit the lights and sirens and get out on the road. Um, and so adding yeah. that extra minute drive time. Only, only works. You're correct if the two front steps get faster. And okay. if you can't get them faster, you're back on four minutes. Okay. I'm not moving the outer marker, maybe fudging 30 seconds, 8 versus 8.30. But I'm, I'm not advocating for 10-minute for uh, first responder arrival. Okay. And then um, are there any stations that are a four-minute? Can you go back to the four-minute? My question is, do we have a – the map is helpful um, because you can – see some, I can see the green around it, but it would be interesting to know the breakdown of stations that are within a four minute drive time. They're in the report. Okay. The tables and tables, Great. both at the station level and the percent of road miles actually covered. Okay. Thank you for that. I appreciate that. We obviously haven't had time to look at the Oh, you haven't. No. You know, you're getting a PowerPoint of a 17, 16 page executive okay. summary of 400 pages. Uh, could we Socratically discuss? You could get me up here, you know, teaching coaching for eight hours yeah. wow. uh, in a compressed 50 slide deck. I'm trying to hit the high notes and say, orchestra leaders, here's some things you're going to pay attention to well, in, I hope you in the ensuing months. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so then my next question is um, so, what's the, do we have a, a population trigger that we look for that four minute or I'm, five minute? I'm going to recommend one in a few slides. Okay, great. Let Thank me get you. a little deeper into the data. Uh, yes, that's where we're headed. Okay. And just, just one more thing, and this is not a question, David, this is to you. The more I'm listening, and, and whoever brought you in, kudos. I mean, the presentation's great. But, David, this stresses the need that our PDC process has to be less cookie cutter and real focused. In engagement from all, all departments. What's happening is, you know, when, when you take a look at developers and when I ask for waivers here, waivers there, and we end up creating an impediment for our trucks and our planning, it's going to take a, a bit more focused coordination. And because of that, that's why I like your team approach that you're introducing to the development process. Not your business, but... No. Well, it's one of my recommendations, along with the trigger point. The, oh, okay. st the staff and research work has to make that implemented. So, real quick, finish the maps. Uh, this is uh, eight minutes for one ladder truck or chief. So, if I only need one of the specialty units in that eight-minute end game, pretty much with 45 and 46, much of the city is reached in eight minutes driving time. Now, that's not effective first due customer service, as we just discussed. But, the, but with the two new stations, the specialty units have the reach at about eight travel minutes. One specialty unit. Not three or four, but at least one. So there's other maps in this study that look at the massing of multiple units. But I first look to see, can I at least get a ladder truck in chief in 90-plus in percent of my city in eight minutes? So, sorry, I'm looking at this map, and if you go back to the top slide, and I'm looking at uh, Councilwoman Bivens, it's actually I believe, your district, 27s. So when I see it on the four-minute and the five-minute, there's an improvement, but when you go down to the next slide, to me that's kind of jarring. We see... Um, so let me explain the difference. Thank you. This is not the measurement of every fire station in eight minutes. This is the measurement of ladder trucks and chief officers and you have fewer ladder trucks and chief officers than you do neighborhood fire engines. A singular quint, other than a quint, the, the specialty units in the American Fire Service serve multiple first due station areas, right? A ladder truck to every three or four engines, philosophically. Uh, this map is looking at how far can those specialty units reach in eight minutes over your road network. You, Thank you for that clarification, which I guess leads me to my next question. Um, can you walk us through the different types of stations, maybe, and, and what we have at those? So, you know, twos is downtown, mm -hmm. 
it's maybe going to look a little different than 11 up north. So, so what you, is that typically you can't, looking you, like? Yes, it's in the report, and you can't it's see it at this, at this scale, but draw your attention to the, the legend. If you're looking at a map in your printed report, and if it's PDF on your screen, you can zoom in right on the image on your laptop or iPad. A red circle's an engine, pure red circles, single fire, fire crew. A dark blue circle's an engine with, with a ladder truck. A red blue circle is an engine with a quint, which is a pumper and a ladder, one, one unit. A blue circle's only the quint. That's a pumper, ladder, single, single team. So the maps are all legended, and those descriptions are in the report, and the performance by station areas in the report. And staff will be happy to obviously, after this morning, walk you through those differences. It is a lot to get your head around, even quickly. And I remind all my clients, there are multiple measures here, and you have to consider many of the measures together to get a comprehensive prescriptive statement to the patient. And I'll use a medic emergency medicine analogy. I walk into your ER bed and say, what's the matter? I'm visually assessing you. I'm listening to you. I order a set of labs. When I get the lab test back, I compare my visual history with my oral history and the lab measures and say, you're not ill or you're ill. Mm -hmm. So response time, simultaneous calls, types of station spacing, formulas, type of trucks, men and women, all combined to say, are we effectively meeting customer service? No, and said this way, no one measure tells the whole story. I can't diagnose you with just a lab, just a blood test. I may order an x-ray or a CT. Um, what are the capabilities of the mutual aid stations? That's my question. And they're, they're mm -hmm. mapped in the study. They didn't make the cut in the slide deck because there's just so much time this morning. Mm -hmm. But they have limited inflow ability because many of them are too far from the city limits to replace a primary Fort Worth fire crew. They can assist, but, but the, you don't give a whole chunk of Fort Worth to, to the mutual aid units. But they're shown in color, and, and, and they're programmed into the mapping study. Thank you. I, I thought about that when Elizabeth mentioned my 27, because within a few miles from there, I've got Hearst. And I didn't know. It, it's so close. I, I actually hold meetings there. I help meetings everywhere. And it's very, very close. I didn't know if that was a consideration, so thanks for raising that. And we do need to talk about that because we touch so many other different municipalities. And I'll just add to that because I leaned back and talked to the fire guys here a second ago. With all the growth that's happening where Ventana is and Veal Ranch and everything else, mm -hmm. we have nothing out there, maybe something plain I, I don't know about. But I know it's, I'm, just, I'm just putting this on the record for, for, for here. So we're in planning as phases as part of it mm -hmm. to making sure that we're service, servicing those as all that growth well, happens. And I'm about to show you your growth location maps and make a very profound recommendation. Mm -hmm. So uh, eight-minute specialty unit reach. And then you, we also, as analysts, remember I talked about multiple calls and workload per hour. Where on the geography is the highest density, in this case, in four years of EMS calls? Well, EMS events typically follow souls per square mile, population density. So you'd have more EMS calls where the population densities are the greatest, fewer in the emerging suburban zones. If you look at the density of building fires, not more inside the loop, given the age of the buildings, uh, right, and the population densities, but there's pockets that break out uh, elsewhere uh, of, of building fires. Now, this is not every building fire. This is a mathematical density map. Where is a greater focus of historic building fires the last four years? So we look at that. Part of this is me just telling you, giving you a taste of what's in 400 pages. So staffing per fire crew. Some units that are outside the loop are busy and have uh, weak second unit travel time. Stations are too far apart. So to meet two in and two out safety uh, preferences for structural firefighting and other reasons, if that first due station is busy on anything and the customer is waiting for second due, 
or if second do, first due has a really critical emergency, that fourth member makes a big difference because now under the safety procedures, I have two teams of two, not one team of two with a supervisor. So long story short here, given the hazard of the buildings, the larger quantity of structure fires inside the loop, the current system is delivering some speed and weight of attack. For the risk to be protected, you need to continue to staff your primary engines and ladders with four firefighters per crew, 24-7, 365. You just don't have the weight and spacing of deployment. Uh, too many of them need all four members on serious emergencies. Okay, growth projections. Thank you, council member. Here's, here's what you just asked for. So I won't go through the data right now in interest of time. You know your growth rate. Uh, you're going to grow from 2020 by about 31% by 2045. My findings are faster residential growth outside the loop at the margins, industrial growth outside the loop in the far northeast, and the bulk of the growth of, of is going to occur where station spacing is the weakest. Yellow light, heads up, this is what's coming. And these are your zoning map. Population density on the left, darker colors are the greatest increases in population, and they're not inside the loop. Industrial commercial zoning entitlement ability on the right, darker colors are, are your growing industrial commercial districts outside the loop. Inside the loop, station spacing historically uh, is better than outside. And a lot of my metro clients, I don't want anybody to feel bad. Over 50 years, communities grow outside the core like tree rings. And most of my metro clients physically challenged with each successive outer ring of growth, the station spacing just got thinner and thinner and thinner. And the curvilinear neighborhood safe streets planning design focus, hey, I uh, first grandkid now, everybody wants their streets to be safe, right? You want them to be walkable and pedestrian friendly. Well, if you do that, you're not building streets conducive to rapid fire truck, ambulance, or garbage truck deployment. There's a trade-off to quality of life versus time over distance on the road network. Okay, deployment summary. Uh, we have suggested some in the report that uh, staff brings back to you refined uh, to adopt response time outcome-driven goals. We recommend you work earnestly in two steps to take the current three-party, three-location system to improve dispatch and turnout time significantly. If that forensic work yields the recommendation to merge the three centers back into one and maybe even distribute internal workflows a bit differently, not just by police, MedStar, and fire silos, but more in an action team sense, uh, we feel there's some long-term opportunities there. But you can save time starting soon, even if the end game is remerge or merge. Don't, don't let that distract you from working today on what you can do with the current technology and people. I'm not advocating that a merger is the only solution on the table. It may well be research driven and technology driven to be a better idea. But right now today, you got a lot of men, women and expensive technology running sit down and look at the workflow procedures and wring some time out of the towel. That's job one. Foster low acuity EMS response systems with MedStar, they are innovating. They are doing non-traditional response networks in a fragile uh, uh, economic e ecosystem. More on that in a moment. And encourage you uh, for fire services, measure all aspects of performance using 90% against the council in the future adopted goal measure. So let's look at what improved response times look like with just tuning today. Fire today in 2021 got on scene, call to arrival at 1021. Police adds to that charitably 30 seconds, but more likely plus a minute to two minutes. That means fire is really getting on scene about minute 13 to 90% of the occurrences. Now, not every call is getting 13 minute customer service. Let me repeat this. Some callers get four and five minute customer service because they're close to a crew, either physically or the crew's out and about in the neighborhood, gets the call and goes. A lot of different math moving here, but to get to 90% of all transactions, upwards of 13 minutes. But if fire saved a minute in turnout time and police transfer dropped to 30 seconds, now fire is arriving at 951. 
haven't tackled the travel time problem. This is retrospective data. Fire could drop just under 10 minutes with front end improvements. MedStar was taking from their hello, not police, round off the numbers here, 14 minutes, just over. If they suffered under long police call processing transfer, they might not be there till the 15th or 16th minute. Too long for acute patient care. Acute patient care. MedStar, if they just got police to shorten their times, could at least drop closer to 14 minutes. And MedStar, as they redefine priority dispatching, can take more seconds out of their call processing time. So if everybody works the front end, I think you get at least fires first responder easily there in less than 10 minutes before you add stations. This is data without 45 and 46, remember. This is over our shoulder last four years. And we'll talk about MedStar and, and paramedics. Due to workloads risks in your large station areas, maintain four firefighter staffing. I've stated open 45s with an engine, a quint, ladder, and a battalion chief uh, as, as finances and hiring and promoting allows. That's not something you flick the switch on. You just can't say staff X number of crews on a moment's notice. And staff, and you all know that. Proceed as planned with station 46. You've acquired the, uh, the land. Keep unit hour utilizations on fire at or below 30% hour after hour after hour. To accomplish that, MedStar continues their low acuity programs approach. However, however, if you lose on the low acuity workload reduction, if fire keeps going to an ever increasing tsunami of public social calls for help, you're going to hit those busiest companies at peak hours of the day. They're going to become overworked, and they're going to need part-time reliever units, squads or full four-person engines at peak hours of the day on an alternative work schedule. You won't need them at 3 a.m., but you're going to need them at 3 p.m. So we've given you an or recommendation there as a backup that if EMS calls continue to climb, what can be done? Adopt trigger thresholds for opening a station. I'm suggesting, based on the growth data we've looked at, at a maximum, when there's more than 10,000 residents in a contiguous area beyond five-minute travel time, I'm kind of back to the brick-and-mortar balancing time on road design. Maybe you do both. Maybe inside the loop it's four minutes, and you know when population density falls below 5,000 a square mile, it's five minutes. Hold that thought. But adopt a policy that says when the souls in a contiguous area reach this number, we've seen it coming, we plan for it, and we're going to open the station when we cross the threshold, not five years after we cross the threshold. So we've recommended an intense data planning team start to work with the planning and development community and model at the sub-zip code level where growth is occurring, what the developers think they'll light off next, start to have a station five or eight year plan and be willing to adjust the next station if development slows in one corner and accelerates in another corner of the city. But you start land shopping for stations, you're closely monitoring response time and development patterns, you bring the two together annually and you update the future fire station master plan. Mm -hmm. You're now ahead of the bus, you're not being caught three years later. And why did I pick 10,000? It's about the size of a small town in Texas that has at least one fire station, coincidentally. You've got some station areas today that have 15 to 20,000 people already in a, a one station area. So I picked 10,000 to start your team's discussion on. There's nothing in America that says 999 is any better than you know, 10,001, but you've got to have some kind of population density, in our opinion, Tied to time. Yes, sir. Uh, just if I could interrupt you for one second, maybe for context, David, um, maybe it's a question for you. How have we done that historically? How has the, the planning done and the projections uh, been completed for where we build and when? Uh, I'm going to go a little bit from memory and just thinking about 43, which is Walsh Ranch and 45, which is the one up in the, the Y area there. Uh, those actually both came from the fire department working, I think, with planning 
at the time, uh, looking at where future development might occur. So Walsh Ranch occurred at a much slower rate. That original development agreement goes back to the early 2000s, right? But I, it, the growth really took off, when I would say, at post-2012. Uh, the 45 is more of a fill-in station, right? So it was um, a prior fire chief that said, we need to beef up the north here and add a station uh, 46 was a conversation with the new developer that was doing Tarleton State. Uh, can't remember the name of the group, but asking them to dedicate some property for the future growth that will go down there. So we will follow the number of rooftops and different facilities that are built down there to decide the uh, timing of uh, designing and building th that new fire station. I think what he's talking about here is looking at Think about the far northeast or uh, south of Walsh Ranch is looking at what do we think that growth profile is going to look like. Um, and I think those are questions that come in about annexation. Yeah. And I think we've got to do a much better job as a staff in, in, because annexation is not free. I mean, it's not just a look at what revenue comes in from new residential communities, but it might be that we look at some of that development and say we uh, need to be really careful about annexing because it could be, and I don't want to make annexation just about a cost-benefit analysis, um, but there are certainly costs that we would incur. If, you, if we had to build a fire station to annex residential property, I would tell you that's not, a, that's not a good proposition if you're looking at it from a business standpoint, right? Because the cost will ex far exceed the revenues that come in from a residential community. And so we need to be thinking about annexation in a much more thoughtful way because it is not free on the expense side. That goes for road maintenance over the long haul, and it also goes for the infrastructure for delivering services as well. But I don't know if that helped answer the question, but we, we like the idea of being able to plan where we ought to annex and fully understand the cost implications of doing so. Okay, and and has our approach changed or improved in any way, techno technologically or otherwise, in how we can model uh, the, yeah. these overlays? Yeah, we're looking more at modeling, right? So yes, we want to develop the models that can overlay because, as as you know, growth doesn't sneak up on you, right? It starts with land transactions and looking at land activity. Then it turns into a plat. Then it turns into a subdivision plan. So these things don't sneak up on us, and we have enough advance notice to be able to do some capital planning and operational planning for what we need to do okay. in the growth areas. And, and what we're seeing on this slide, um, are we in agreement of the 10,000 threshold? And do we have I think we want to look at that. I, is I, excuse type. me, I'm I'm not in agreement. I'm saying it's a starting number to, to have a deep planning dive around. Yeah. Okay. And to bring back to you, when do the souls per square mile exceed your policy comfort level yeah. for first responder services? That's a that's an involved conversation. And I'm just trying to say, such as I could have said five thousand. I'm just yeah. priming your conversation. I think the variables are the right variables. It's picking what do we think the right numbers are. That's still up for discussion. But I think variables and modeling is the right direction. Okay. As part of the study, do we have any locations in the city that would meet that particular 10,000 uh, resident requirement to need a yeah. station? You have developed fire station areas today that already exceed that, and it's the only one fire station. So we've given you a table in the study of, po of population uh, by station area uh, and, and uh, along with the workloads and all the other metrics to take this comprehensive evaluation to say, where do we tend to calibrate when too far is too far, is how many people is too many? And, and staff needs to, as they work the modeling, bring you back some policy considerations. And it might also vary by types of risks. You might get some extraordinarily, but jobs, uh, beneficial risks, and you and those industrial or commercial applicants go, 
we really like you here sooner rather than later. Where you develop large, large lot, two homes to the acre, uh, many horse ranch properties, and the developer is going to take 20 years to get to build out because it's just to just, just say that their performa, you kind of put that on the back burner and say that may never even build out. But over yonder, we've got infill live work units in a new urban setting, but it's out in a neighborhood that's redeveloping. And we, now we've got population densities really growing and calls densities. Let's go pay attention to that versus the, the two to the acre zoning. A lot of moving parts here. Well, so, let me ask a question. I'm sorry, Alan. Go Alan ahead, Chris. Chris. Oh. Sorry. You've been waiting. I missed you. Go ahead. It's okay. So uh, Elizabeth kind of asked part of my question, uh, but the ask would be, have, have you all done any kind of study on this? Are there areas specifically where you would recommend we look at now for stations? And then the second question I want to ask is, uh, related to assets currently deployed at stations. Have, have you all taken a look and do you have uh, recommendations on asset deployment between our stations as they exist now and ways we could better, uh, better provide coverage through uh, additions or movement? Uh, the, the, the short answer is yes. For example, what I recommended for station 45, apparatus and staffing. Um, and there's other maps and pieces of the study that talk about the reach of the ladder units, the reach of the chiefs, and the road miles of coverage. So yes, that data is there. With regards to population density, if I go back to that slide, and I won't in interest of time, we were scoped in the timeline to get this done, this budget cycle from when we were hired in, in, in late winter. We couldn't sit down with planning and do the demography and deep modeling that your city manager just said they're capable and will and can increasingly ramp up. I just looked at those two growth maps. I'm simple, right? I pulled out your general plan, your zoning, and said, oh my gosh, outside the loop. Oh, outside the loop. Station spacing, I already know from my study, is thinnest outside the loop. Survey says start to be more rigorous in your advanced planning and locating those future uh, station or apparatus needs. I mentioned peak activity units. For example, busy peak hours of the day, but sometimes you have to bring crews into the training center for physical hands-on training, just no other way around it. Well, that district's empty for two or three hours while training occurs. And training's got to move and cover. Well, I can't create too many holes at 3 p.m. because I can't erode deployment. But if I have a battalion that's super busy in the afternoon, and I need to take them to training a few days a month, I could put on a four-person engine that's float, and I've recommended this to other clients. This four-person crew floats for five or eight hours covering calls, both for peak hour demand and for vacancies created by training. So there's all kinds of so solutions out there, and we've talked about some of that in the study. But I've got more, a more important thing I'm about to say. I think there's things you do before you reach that threshold. First tune up your advanced planning. Have a council policy on customer service goals and when you think too far is too far. And then once you establish those policy benchmarks, staff then works the data back to say, well, here's where we're going to focus first and second and seventh. Okay, that's physical fire stations. Now, Chris, did you have something? Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. No. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I'm just looking at the clock. I didn't see the hand. My bad. Okay. He's going to wait. Um, improved paramedic delivery. You have what's uh, in the United States called a public utility model. But any ambulance system in America has operated for the better part of my adult working life as an economically closed ecosystem that paid, that paid its bills by revenue received from transports, not public tax money. And I'm not going to use the term subsidy because I don't want subsidy to sound evil or bailout or failing. But ambulance services bill for services. And you know what's happened is calls for service and costs of labor and equipment have exploded in America. Medicare and Medicaid have never kept reimbursements consistent with the cost of services. 
Most closed economic ambulance systems in the United States today are in tough financial times. I've got a chapter of summary information from MedStar's reports. MedStar will be more than happy to explain their fiscals to you. But let me say on their behalf, my educated analyst opinion is they're not deploying more ambulances because they're increasingly financially up against the wall. I think your delivery of first paramedic care is some degree not equitable 24-7 to all neighborhoods. It depends too many on the specialty units having a paramedic free if the, if the local ambulance is already busy and you're getting there north of 10 minutes. Whatever you do to the MedStar data, on the front end, processing, can't, there's no turnout time to fix. They have too many road miles to cover, arguably at times of the day with too few ambulances. And if they don't have the money to improve that, where does the conversation go? So back to my what's really important today, the top five themes, here's, here's the next one. We'd like to see you increase paramedic ambulance coverage to 90% of the priority one incidents at just under 10 minutes. We think that's a, that's a reasonable goal for acute patient care and what I've called and others in the staff of starting with your leader at the end of the table, co-leader, um, uh, the city manager, I think you should adopt a policy of patient-centric care because to do otherwise, you're allowing economics to deliver the care you can, not the care that you might expect in acute emergencies. I'll say that again. Patient-centric care is not economically driven. It's driven by what do we want in how many minutes to get there, and let's find a way to fund it. Economically driven care is rationed care is in much of healthcare today in America, right? Well, you don't really need that CT. Uh, Council Member Firestone, it's really expensive, and let's just put you in an ICU bed for a few hours and monitor the situation. That physician darn well knows economics are driving patient care choices. I'm not saying it's totally bad. I'm saying if you prefer a better level of neighborhood paramedics, option A, MedStar's got to find the revenues to increase their deployment matrix and perform consistently under, at this council's adopted policy level. Or, and or, I walked into a situation I didn't expect when I started this job. Your fire department had, for special services and other reasons, gradually grown a paramedic firefighter workforce. In a lot of the United States, most, not most, many, many fire engines are paramedics. Dallas, right next door, par paramedic on every fire engine. They stop the clock until the ambulance gets there, and if the ambulance is delayed, too busy, bad weather, flat tire, pick a reason, at least one paramedic from the neighborhood fire station is on scene. You've got 90 paramedics, plus or minus right now, in the Fort Worth Fire Department. I have to divide them into three shifts per day, right, ABC, rotating 24-hour platoons. That gives you, because you have to factor in vacancies and who can work where, when, you could, in a matter of months, in our humble opinion, deploy 20 to 25 paramedic engine companies, not some of the time as you do today, 24-7, 365, and work with MedStar to put them in the harder-to-serve areas or the clinically high-demanding areas. Got to look at both sets of math. Hard to get to, high demand. And then option three would be, do you take the paramedic fire response system citywide, staff's got to bring those costs and timelines back to you, that's not an overnight thing, or increase MedStar's capacity. If MedStar hits the fiscal wall, then should Fort Worth invest more dollars of local tax revenues into MedStar for Fort Worth desired customer service levels. So my last bullet says, if Fort Worth sets a paramedic first response policy that is more aggressive than today's and equitable to all 46, 47, 50 station areas, regardless of population density, regardless of different severities, they need more money. If you're going to give them that money and you prefer the ambulance approach over the fire approach once you fully vet this with, with your staff leaderships, if you give them significant money for a significantly different customer service than the rest of the system, 
I, I'm saying publicly, you need to look at the governance ability for you to ensure that your investment guarantees inside the corporate limits of Fort Worth the customer service this council wants. I am not saying blow up the interlocal agreement. I want to be that on the record. I'm saying governance and money and quality of service have to be prescriptive enough that the council knows a future investment is delivering to Fort Worth. Uh, you're not in charge of the suburban cities. We all know that. But within your corporate limits, what's your level of customer service? And if you're going to pay more to get it, whom do you pay under what degree of, of policy control? Enough on that. I've really got to go through fire headquarters staffing. So as you know, there was a budget gap this year. And we, we, we and, and our finance team member uh, looked at it. Here's, here's the headlines. A confluence of factors caused this year's budget deficit. And it's really, to some degree, a systemic thing and exacerbated by COVID exposed the weakness in the system. Not staff weakness, but weaknesses in the system. Let me explain. The department prior to COVID was budgeting overtime year over year based on last year's usage. They just took a small percentage increase and said, let's put a bit more in this year. There's things, are ch things maybe cost a bit more to backfill on overtime. However, headquarters since the mid-1980s or early, maybe even before, certainly in the last pre-leadership here and under this leadership, headquarters was reassigning, they, we call it loaned in the report, it's the old internal term for it, they reassigned fire station staffing to do 40-hour jobs in headquarters. It was the only way as headquarters programs and services grew, they fed it with line fire personnel. Well, Stu, how did they pay for that? Well, they had salary and benefit savings because you always run vacancies, right? You misjudge hiring and academy, timing and cycling. You have positions that you never pay a dime for. They converted salary savings to replacement overtime for the transfer program. Worked beautifully <laughs> in, until, until COVID. Now, workers' comp time loss explodes, and yes, you got two years of federal offsetting dollars. This year, you didn't have the federal offsetting dollars. So you had upwards of 60 today, when we did it in March, 60 personnel from fire station assigned to headquarters, 40-hour jobs. Sick leave, workers' comp is up because of COVID. You were under-budgeting overtime, and the fire department budget ended up in the red depending on the number and the date you measure it, uh, a little under you know, $19 million. So the system was working, and you didn't see the weak spots? No one did, right? Until COVID said, oh my gosh, our, our, our replacement overtime headaches enormous. Um, so when we looked at headquarters, they're properly organized into 19 business sections into four bureaus, they're completely necessary for a metropolitan fire department to meet local uh, and national uh, regulations and best practices. They're by no means overstaffed. Uh, you don't have people sitting in a back room doing some nice to do thing uh, 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 over expensively. But over many years, the reassigned positions uh, ebbed and flowed, plus or minus 30 to as high as 60 in March. In March, the loan position program represented 29%, 29% of all of the headquarters team. It fiscally was working when there were salary savings and enough requested overtime to budget it. So I wanna also make this very clear. I'm about to talk about refining those positions and studying and permanency or not. Well, I'm not advocating you turn them all off tomorrow. You can't take 29% of the headquarters team and just put them back in the fire stations in a fortnight. There's going to be service level reductions if that's the council's policy choice. But you don't have to do that. The loan program is in place. The people are working. Some have been returned to the line for overtime balancing late this spring. So what we're recommending you do in a broad sense is to keep services pace at pace with growth in the department and the city. We consider in headquarters converting some positions to non-sworn over time. We've identified in the following table our top priority for reassigned positions review. 
Instead of looking at the whole program, we've broken into three tiers. I'm about to show you tier one, which is largely mandated, really, really should do programs. Fire inspections, arson investigations, some logistical supply. And by the way, all of these workers, these are not chief officers. These are not senior civil servants. These are line workers doing meat and potatoes work in the internal gears of the, of the machine. And you, re, you look at the priority one positions and say, do we want to continue them as reassignments? Do we want to give permanent funding to some of them? Do we want to convert some to non-sworn? I'm just saying it's time Fort Worth to get your head around a more permanent staffing performa for headquarters that you can then properly budget for. I, don't, I want to be very clear on the record. I'm not saying the reassigned program was bad, but that combined with under budgeting forensically over time, combined with a strong storm that came through and knocked your earned leave sky high, um, you, you can't fix that overtime hole just by putting people back in fire stations and have a safe, effective headquarters. So these are the priority one positions of the 60. We think 38 deserve a, a tier one uh, scrutiny and there's 11 in executive services and another 27 in support services, logistics, and communications. And to speak for Chief Davis briefly, what do you mean communications? Well, remember I mentioned as 911 gets busy, rollover happens to fire dispatch. It takes a few more dispatchers per shift if they're now answering active 911 calls as well as just the total cost uh, increase. Headquarters summary recommendations, build a robust, multifaceted. I have a, sorry, before oh, you move on. I didn't see it. I just want to understand these numbers. Right now, I think you're saying there's 60. In March. In March. Ba back were, in March, there were 60. They were on loan. They were on loan reassigned. And out of that, so help me understand this chart, if you'll flip back. The 38, you're saying, are priority? Our, our, our top priority to give stability to. Yes, so out of those 60, there's start, 30. Start, start with these 38 yeah. and say, how do we maintain them going forward? Okay. Permanent new budgeted cost. They could still be the rank of firefighter, lieutenant, or captain. Right. But do I have to hire more line people to put the 38 quantitatively back into fire stations right. in lieu of overtime? Or look at the cost and salary savings post-COVID Maybe you want to run the 38 on salary savings. Just budget for it so you, you, you see it coming. Okay. So that's 38, but there's still some other that are loaned positions. Yes. Th those would be like tier two. And three. And three. So, so okay. we tiered up. That might be in the report that we didn't get until 11 yeah. last night. No, it's right. needed yeah. to maintain yeah. regulatory and needed services today. Strongly ought to do programs yeah. in, a, in a 13th largest city in America. Mm -hmm. And then there's the nice, nicer to do programs, some of the social and education outreach stuff, not legally mandated. You won't get in trouble if you don't do it, but, but there's an impact there. And we want staff to bring you back those impacts along with the, the adequacy of how many total people. So the sort of follow up to that is there were 60 loaned, et cetera, and there's a tiered system to get them back or to prioritize. Is that saying, in some essence, there's 80-plus positions that the fire department should have since those were no. actual firefighters that moved no. over? So, yeah. so, no, we're okay. saying they're operating today with the 60 reassignments. Right. Solidify those duties, sworn, non-sworn, permanent versus reassignments. Take all that into the mix. We then projected on our best practice insights and experience where headquarters could likely grow in the future. And I'll just say it this way, it's in the report. 60 is stability, 60 is not the future. Okay. And you have more than 60 in headquarters today. Remember I said it's 29% of the pie. Right. You've still got this big pie. Right. And as you add people and services over the years, the headquarters support cast members have to grow. Right. That's all. That's all we said in the report. Okay. And so we'll probably talk about that or it's in the report, what those numbers should look like. I just wanted some clarification there. Can I, yeah, uh, I, I guess I'm <laughs> uh, trying to figure it. It's like three-dimensional firehouses and people moving around here. Um, so I, I, maybe similar to Michael, I'm trying to just get my arms around um, 
you know, what do we have today? Historically, what, what decisions have we made to fill the needs? And, and where are we trying to get to? You know, are we, are we trying to solve for historical problems immediately and then project? Or are we simply saying we need to write, here's the right size for today and then what to antic anticipate in the future? It's a very good question, especially because you haven't had a chance to study like 50 pages. So the answer is, council member, this is an inflection point to bring stability to the system. We want you to study everybody out there today and make some workload and customer service driven decisions. What's the right number? How to permanently uh, su supply that number? And once you get stability to today's programs, then look to the future. And I've got a slide in a minute. I'm, I'm, I'm precursing what I'm about to say. Get stability first, refine the understanding as you tune up the program for headquarters. And then those business metrics will help you set what future FTEs demand, just like population growth for fire stations. If I can project what the business community is bringing me as fire marshal to inspect new buildings, well, I can see the new building inspection growth two years out, right? Mm -hmm. I can start to say I may need another two ins ins inspectors out there. Or I'm br they're bringing in buildings that, ha that take six hours to inspect versus one hour, so I have to have more FTEs because the complexity of my workload's gotten better or worse. So we want you, not all the business units in headquarters today have really defined workload measures against a customer service outcome. They're just doing what they're being, the community is asking them to do without coming back here and saying there's a cost benefit to this. So we want you to get, solidify that. I've, 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 I've got a, you still? Okay, I, I, I have a question and I'm gonna look at the chief to nod to me in case, I just wanna make sure I'm on the right track. I got the report late last night, but I really appreciated the executive summary too, so thank you. Uh, one big takeaway for me on this is, historically, we have budgeted in overtime. And this appears to bring some level of stability and balance by having the proper staffing and the dollars to match. Is that, is that happening with this recommendation? I don't see how you budget on overtime. So, well, I, well, I think the answer is yes when the recommendation is implemented over the next several months by staff. Okay, okay. So I'm, I'm so good with that. We would need a policy change, too. No, so uh, let's, let's, let's <clears throat> let Elizabeth and Carlos yeah. finish questions, and then yeah. let's get to the end of the presentation. And I have a feeling we're going to break for lunch. Yep, get food, come back in here, and then we got lots of questions, I know. Is that Okay. Does that work? Yeah, Go ahead, Elizabeth, you had a question. My, my flight's not till 5.45. Oh, so, good. So okay. I, I, I am yours, <laughs> but I did promise a wife, a mother, and a granddaughter I would be home late You're gonna tonight. You're going to make that happen. Okay. okay. So is, can I keep going, or is there another question on Anything the Anything right now that we need to address? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Well, I, I'll wait till the end on this okay. one, because this is really more for staff. Okay. okay. Go ahead, please. Thank you. So um, build the overtime predictive model, better, stronger. We've also identified positions in headquarters to reduce what we call single point failure, where you only have one person trained in a complicated job without a backup, or one person is handling revenues and debits, which in accounting principles, right, should always be separated. You don't charge somebody something, and then the same person book the revenue in. So our finance uh, uh, department had worked with uh, Mark Rauscher and his team, and some of that's in the budget decision package before you. So in parallel with all this, staff can tell you later what they've already are working on. So this is not static. Staff's not going to start cold tomorrow. They've already got things in the upcoming fiscal year to address. And some of them differ from our recommendations, and that's okay. This is a coaching, coaching Socratic push-pull. We see it this way, and maybe we see it pale yellow, and they see it bright yellow, and they elevate a position outside of the tier I recommended. They live here. They know the real issues. 
and they've taken the advice and they're changing uh, the team as they think best fits their, their needs right now. And we all, as consultants, respect that. We can only drive them so far. I'm not your chief, much less your city manager, not one of you. And we can just say in the compressed time frame, we had this study and we turned a lot of things over. Here's the things to continue to, 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 to action plan. Okay, second, second takeaway, or third takeaway, equip all reserve fire apparatus for use without needing to transfer equipment from frontline units under repair from the warehouse. Some of that's a weather outdoor storage problem. Some of it's just a supply train cost of goods. Do we keep everything equipped or do we take an hour or two to transfer from warehouse or a frontline rig if the frontline rig breaks to have the reserve rig we want the reserve rigs equipped and we want them equipped sooner rather than later because as you just had with the flood disaster, if you had to recall the off-duty platoon and put 10 reserves in service, you don't have 12 hours notice to do that. As soon as the staff shows up, the reserves have to be put in frontline service because you're in a, a, a disaster-driven event. Last, the fleet and information technology staffs are growing uh, and have different, better abilities. And we think department's fleet and information technology staffs can better crosstalk and talk about how they can integrate and self-support each other. Uh, a little bit of historic siloed organizational design, not, not people, I'm just saying organizational design there. And I think some improvements, some bandwidth could be improved by better cross-working. Uh, with uh, uh, citywide IT and fleet. So capstone recommendations priorities. This is the end. Number one, which you just asked me, stabilize, become data-driven, improve policy oversight. Set policies to deliver the outcomes you want in consideration of the public and firefighter safety. Streamline dispatch now. Time is everything. Refine how to continue effective headquarters programs. As growth occurs, by policy, maintain equitable neighborhood-based fire and paramedic care, and we're calling that establishing a patient-centric customer quality of care triggers for the right-sized field and headquarters services, and consider the use of non-sworn FTEs for appropriate headquarters. An example, that would be a warehouse logistician. Um, fire mechanics can be firefighters, but they're still certified. They could also be non-sworn uh, mechanics with a career ladder. So just take a take a renewed look at some of that. Next steps. So I told you a lot of slides ago. Um, today's for questions and, and uh, uh, contemplating what's before you. In the uh, most of my clients, not most, many clients at this point, at the end of the day, turn to staff and say, "Would you bring us back a framework for implementation? Would you bring us back an implementation plan?" a master plan, something in a couple of months that says this is how we put the improvements into, into actionable motion. Uh, direct staff, uh, uh, when they come back for that implementation discussion to lower dispatch processing time, improve paramedic first response to all neighborhoods by directing the deployment of the already available firefighter paramedics. You have that tool. It doesn't have to be either or initially. Open Fire Station 45, uh, as you can uh, staff it with uh, appropriate equipment. Resolve permanency and funding of headquarters services. We've also just recommended as many metro cities grow, uh, uh, eventually they realize that they're tasking the fire chief to take on a whole nother big line of work in emergency services organization. Your fire department loves it. They're very good at it. They're respectfully very proud of what they did during COVID. Those, however, are also grant-funded positions. Vacancies occur. They are really, really well-trained now. It's a college discipline, and some of them come out of ex-military. You can really get some permanent, non-sworn disaster preparedness professionals to bring stability to that, and in my opinion, take one headache off the fire chief's plate. But it's open to conversation. This is not a negative fix-it recommendation. I'm just saying most of my metros have started to separate that away from the police or fire chief and make it a dedicated unit in the city manager's office. Longer term, establish that planning, data analytics, development services team with fire for growth triggers, 
where growth is going to occur, have council adopt the policy that identifies the trigger point for adding fire stations. I'm sorry it took two hours, but you had really good questions. And yes, 58 slides in 60 minutes was ambitious, uh, but you're asking everything that I expected. So thank you for the attention and the time in the chair. I have a, a couple questions. And yeah. it's actually directly on what you just mentioned. First, thank you for taking the time to try to condense so much information into slides. And um, I think as, as you have learned today, this council is quite inquisitive and you can never fully prepare for the answers that are the questions that we're all going to ask. Um, and a lot of these questions, I don't think we would need to ask if we had had the study before today. And so my question to you is, when did you initially transmit this final study to our staff? After the last round of fact check on uh, discussions and a conference call, it was approximately early evening our time Tuesday. Okay. Off the top of my head without looking at my calendar and, and, e and email threads. Okay. And then yesterday while I was flying, we were still editing and discussing certain fine points in the PowerPoint. Mm -hmm. um, between uh, the final delivery and staff routing it and signing off on it for the very last time, I'll also say in deference to everybody, this was a huge project. It took a long time to contract. We didn't start till late winter. I haven't told you this before, uh, but we got, got into some real integration of incident data database headaches between the multiple record systems. We didn't even get police processing time, so we went back to Tarrant County and had the aha. They electronically measure the hello. They know when the circuits become a live voice circuit. Your police computer doesn't. They don't track off hook. And the world never programmed it to. That's not a negative police decision. So we had delays reassembling databases, including some very candid open work with MedStar. We drag in a summer. Early June, we do mid-project. We're still finishing research. We made an aggressive commitment uh, to get the first full draft, which we made, to the city on Wednesday, August 3rd. Okay. And since Wednesday, August 3rd, You've largely consumed my team's, I'm not going to say it on the record because I've got clients probably listening. We, we made a Herculean push to vet and fact check a lot of the little numbers, not the big policy things, but the little numbers. And it took through this last weekend. Okay. So this is certainly not my preference to brief without the document. Would not have been my advice, but because you all were teed up today and we knew rescheduling this many people, me included, was going to be awkward. I supported staff's decision to transmit late and let's start the conversation today knowing that nothing stops today. Sure. This is just the ongoing big work effort. I appreciate all of your effort and this is to staff. So it sounds like we've had this report for a couple of days and we got it at 11 o'clock last night. 300 pages, a 50-page executive summary. I can't tell you. I've lost count of the number of times we have asked a question and been told it was in the report. We didn't have the opportunity to review that report. That's a, a disservice to this council. It's a disservice to the residents. Last year, when we sat at this table in August and we told you we wanted more firefighters, and David Cook, you pushed back. You told us it wasn't in the budget, and we told you we wanted more firefighters. And that started this process of the staffing study. And we said we would agree to 10 firefighters and not, the, I think it was 20 or 25 that we originally asked for, if we had this staffing study, and it was my direction, and I was very clear that this should occur before the budgeting process so that we could have this conversation. Because what I've heard today is not we need 50 new firefighters or we need two-person apparatuses or 26-person apparatuses. What I've heard today is that there's a lot of policy implications that impact this budget that we don't get to have today because we didn't get the report that you've had for 
48 hours, and I understand that you maybe were refining a PowerPoint, and that's great, but we could have already taken the time to start digesting this and maybe not have so many questions and um, have a better idea of what we're doing because now we're going into a budget cycle, and it sounds like we need to talk about what we're doing with 911 and how we're staffing that, what we're doing with um, our development services and how we're integrating that, what civilian positions need to be in the fire department versus sworn, and we don't get to have that decision today because staff elected to transmit a 300-page report at 1047 last night, and that is wholly unacceptable. David, you want to respond, but I know Jared has a question, so I don't want to forget him. Sorry, Jared. I think that's a relevant point Councilmember Beck brought up, so I'm willing to wait for this discussion. I'll go ahead and respond. I think you've got the report uh, at the thoroughness that it needed to be at the timetable we were able to deliver it. What you've got is a recommended budget that's before you that includes some of the recommendations that we knew was coming. There are some key policy choices uh, that will come before the council. What you've heard from him, you've heard in the budget recommendation that occurred a couple weeks ago. We have money in the budget for a 911 study. We have money in the budget for a 911 coordinator because you're right, nobody in the organization owns the 911 process from beginning to end. We're gonna fix that. It's not just about hiring more people in the police dispatch. Is somebody's gotta own that process from beginning to end. One of my takeaways from the study and Stu's help is Nobody's using the data either that's in the 911 system, not any of our departments. And so we need to use the data that also exists in that system. Stu talked about, right, our utilization of all the fire crews. We're, none of our fire stations is close to 30% utilization. We do have some response time issues that we're gonna have to deal with. Uh, as Stu mentioned that we ought to continue on our path of Station 46 that is down in Councilmember Williams area and to add an engine company in Station 45. That's also in the budget. It is important that we become more patient-centric. More of our calls have to do with EMS calls than anything else. There's money in the budget to look at whether we want to give more support to MedStar so yes, the recommended budget is, was put on the table a couple weeks ago, includes some of those recommendations. It doesn't complete the work because some of those policy questions are gonna come back before the city council. But yes, we would have all loved to have had this completed and wrapped up by June. That did not happen and did not take place. And, it is, and it's not even wrapped up now. So I don't, it, it's not even completed now because even that conversation about loan positions or reassigned positions, we need to bring to you the detail. Most of the, those are funded and allocated positions. They existed in 2018 and 2019, and we'll come give you what we think the gap looks like in 2023. But uh, that's a lot of rambling, but we have used the draft report along the way to make recommendations of what's been put in the budget. Gina, go ahead. Yeah. I appreciate that, and I, I believe you, but we should be afforded the opportunity to look at that. And if we were presented a budget before we were presented this, and we were given how many hours to, to review it, before we have those conversations, y'all are not doing the job of helping us govern this city by giving us the information we need in a timely manner so we can make these decisions. Gina, so I want us to do better. My question is, number one, well, now I'll give you the statement. I think last budget year was very clear. Council members wanted to see more firefighters, uh, not more by way of overtime or by way of delaying the hiring. We really wanted to see more firefighters. And in our limited knowledge, in terms of how you establish staffing needs, I think the number 10 rings a bell and what we came up with, I don't know. But uh, it, it's important to me that we number one, you know, I've, I've been in an ambulance. I've been in a fire truck you know, after calling 911. 
my firefighters got to me and I'm alive today. So the, the staffing needs of our fire department is very important to me. And I hope we can get the answer before we adopt this budget. How many new positions in fire will this budget fund? And I think you're going to see pretty much a council united in the need to see that and understand that. Because I, I don't want to be told, well, you're going to get 10, but then there's a backstory to how that 10 is counted. And so that's, that's, that's my, uh, my response to, the, to this. And my partner just got back from out of town. We're glad you made it back safely, but you're once again redhead on alert. Okay. Yeah, Thank I you. Love, just, I'm just, just speak. Just to, I want to be clear. There are 23 new positions in the in the recommended budget for fire. 14 have to do with the engine company at Station 45 or wherever we want to put it up in the far north. Uh, there are five civilian positions. I'm going to lose a few here. There's some for the Hope team, and there's two protective gear specialists. So there's 23 in the recommended budget. And my follow-up later will be when we have this discussion continued, I'll be asking the chief, are those the positions that he is requesting? Jared, go ahead. Thank you, and thank you, Stu, for the report. Um, um, similar to Councilman Beck, I, I wish I would have had more chance to dive into it, but um, I, have a, I have a question around, basically trying to wrap my head around firefighters supporting um, EMS calls. Um, so if if firefighters are supporting EMS calls, um, and I, I appreciate your um, you know analogy of the five fingers, um, what is the level of staffing needed to support um, that additional support of the EMS system? Um, and then what's the appropriate, um, in your opinion, response time for MedStar for the calls are left? And how does that relate to the 38? Um, priority one positions on loan for the central office. I was staring into the light because there's like four things to unpack. It's it's the right question. I'm trying to figure out how to weave it together for you. Um, with regards to, to EMS patient care, <clears throat> it needs to be a crawl, walk, run approach. You don't have enough ambulances, in my opinion, today to demonstrably lower ambulance travel time. Even if they were sitting on fiscal reserves, which they're not, you can't hire and deploy ambulances fast enough to make a material difference in a year to two. COVID wrecked paramedic EMT nurse physician training in the United States. Every ambulance institution, even some fire departments, are under severe staffing train. They can't get paramedics and EMTs out of the pipeline. Fortunately here, I'm suggesting two things at once. You ask MedStar, what does better look like? And, and does it come at something you can't afford? And fire chief, we can at least deploy every day 20 to 25 firefighter engine teams and consider growing that. Now, the chief can't go manufacture another 90 paramedics either in six months. But you take the 90 you've got, deploy them 20 to 25 a day to help fill in the more difficult areas, you're buying time and improving patient care immediately. And then figure out long-term, should that go citywide with firefighters or be the ambulance service? I'm suggesting, as a metro, you already have a four-person crew. You've already got the sunk cost of deploying 24-7, 365, four people. Many other response systems would make one of them a paramedic to be in every neighborhood and stop the clock on acute emergencies and let the ambulance times economically and justifiably for acute calls lengthen a bit. But if you don't deploy paramedics and neighborhood fire stations, your ambulance systems got to get a more strength and deployment. Both of those are going to take some time to study. Number three, some of the headquarters team members do support training and quality of care oversight for paramedics. 
So in the United States, much less Texas, there are quality of care and oversight standards, just like there are for licensed nurses, radiology techs, right? It's, it's, it's a clinical profession with standards, recertification, and oversight. There needs to be people in headquarters to manage that. You have a tiny team today. If you deploy the 90, the 90 medics or choose to grow the program, that's going to impact the headquarters positions. We don't know how many until you decide the customer service delivery model. So the focus in the next few months between the city staff and MedStar is we need to bring back the economics and the choices for policy, and then that'll give us the numbers, and they're either going to impact MedStar more than you or they're going to impact Fort Worth Fire, and part of that decision package has to be does headquarters support the number of paramedics you're trying to deploy. But I want to restress, the good news is I've got clients that don't have paramedics already and would have no hope of getting more quickly while they wait for the training pipeline to repair itself. You know, this is, my analogy to somebody yesterday was, this is like the airlines with flight crews right now. Hey, Southwest would love to return its schedule to normal. It just doesn't have the pilots. And you can't manufacture pilots in a fortnight. Mm -hmm. Healthcare workers, same way. Does that answer your question, council member? Yes, let me ask a follow-up, and I appreciate that as well. Um, Mayor Pro Tem uh, said it well, and many of y'all know that my dad was in a similar experience in one of the areas that wasn't covered by the five-minute uh, times, um, and he needed ambulance services, and, you know, fire was there. I'm not sure if a paramedic was on the truck, so that makes sense as well, but fire was there and EMS wasn't during the snowstorm, um, and I ultimately had to um, get the firefighters help to load my dad in a car and drive him to the um, ER. Um, and so I guess what I'm trying to get at is let's just talk sheer numbers. Um, the recommendation from staff right now is 23 authorized uh, positions added. Um, you said that we have 38 priority um, that need to be filled because of the loan program. Um, and then how many additional, if we decide to continue supplementing the medical system, um, the uh, EMS system with firefighter support, how many additional staff on top of the 38 will we need to be able to buy us some time in the meantime until another study happens to figure out the number for the long-term policy discussions. I, staff needs to answer the second half of that. Let me clarify something you just said, which was a, a partial adding of two things that shouldn't be added together. Those 38 reassigned positions are filled today with budgeted firefighters. They're out there as we speak today doing their jobs uh, at, at fire headquarters. They're, they're, that was the clarification. Yeah, yeah. I they're, 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 how did it relate? So the, the 60 got turned down a bit in the spring for overtime uh, savings to try to balance the budget. The conversation needs to be, what's the minimum? 38, 48, 60. How do we provision those permanently? What type of employee? But you have them working today, many of them, not all of the 60. Then if you deploy 20 to 25 paramedic responders, the chief has to go talk to the paramedic oversight staff and say, if we go from anecdotal, a few paramedic engines a day to all into this commitment, also in your partnership with the local, because there's station bidding assignments and other factors to work out, part of this needs a, needs a discussion with your firefighters leadership. Uh, chief, if we deploy those 2025 paramedics, what's it mean in headquarters oversight? And I haven't studied that with the chief. I, I don't have an opinion on it other than to say it will have an impact. But until we know the number and the policy choice, it's a, I don't want to off the wall say it's two more or it's seven more. Can I just make one? I appreciate that answer. And to Councilmember uh, Beck's point, um, that's why we needed the study earlier because we're having policy discussions while also having the budget conversation, um, and it really should have been done earlier. David, I just have a point of clarification. I've had a chance to look at this. It is 23 new positions being authorized for the fire department, right? Yes. But nine of those are administrative staff, and we're talking 38 is the first priority. Is that right? 38 is what he's identified out of the 60. Those, those but, positions. But I'm just looking at the numbers here. Uh, there's only nine. Yeah, but this one. Yeah. Those positions already exist and yeah. they're funded. Yeah. Right. So the 
question is what are the additional allocations that would be needed to support those headquarters? Is it right? Those already exist and are funded. Yeah. I'm not saying what's not funded. The 60 of our firefighters that have been moved to administrative positions, right? But you're saying 23. I just want to point out it's only nine that would be an administrative that could move nine off the right for this budget. Am I, miss, am I missing no, something? No, what we need to bring yeah. back to you okay. is how all the positions are allocated that are not in operations. Okay. That are already funded. Okay. Either through direct allocations of staff, and there's a person and a position, right, or they've been funded through overtime, which was temporary partly because of the COVID. So we need to bring that back to you. And a follow-up question to those administrative positions in looking at some of the findings and recommendations, and this may be a better question for Chief, but some of the new administrative positions in this current budget is the plan to utilize those employees for some of the more administrative duties that some of your firefighters have been conducting that are causing some of your backlog and some of the findings you're seeing, especially related to overtime. Is that true, Chief? Tell me if I'm not right. You have to go up to the microphone, sorry. Uh, good morning, good afternoon now. Uh, some of the uh, the 23, two of them are dedicated to supporting the um, homeless corridor like, like, along Lancaster Avenue that we have talked and been working with the Fort Worth Police Department in such a positive way. Uh, those are directly related to the conversation at the table. The civilian positions that are added to the budget, and I, I'm correct, I believe there are five, um, are to support payroll, uh, workman's compensation, um, and those are uh, not firefighter positions now. They are additional work responsibilities that we're uh, trying to become more efficient with. Anything to add to that, Mark? No? So, okay. does that That's answer helpful. your question? Yeah, and maybe, and I know we're going to break for lunch and then come back and sit down, so maybe one observation might be, and I know there's a lot of tension around the table. This is hard work. And this is a this is a study to keep in mind that will not just impact this budget. In many ways, this budget is just a start for what we're going to have to do in the next coming years and setting up the department and the city for success. That's my one observation. The second would be um, there are findings in here and, and some of the recommendations that from a budget perspective, I do see the start. Like, let's just take 911 study, for instance. That is the most fundamental thing we're going to have to figure out because none of these other things are going to be helped before that. Um, and we're talking about salaries. I was just texting with Ken to ask him what the starting salary is for an EMT. At MedStar, it's just north of $38,000 a year. You know, you could make a lot of money at Amazon right now. And so we're competing with a really difficult workplace environment that has nothing to do with health care necessarily. So I, these are all complex problems we're going to have to face um, as a council. Um, and then the last thing I would say before we break is um, to get some of these things done, this body is going to have to work together with management or we ain't going to get anywhere. And so what I would ask of each of you is to bottle your frustrations, be really detailed in your questions and concerns, because we have time both in this budget over the next month and importantly, in planning for the next six, preparing for the next fiscal year to get the work done. And I think while we all ran, which is to make it better than we found it, and making sure that another council in the future doesn't have these same complex problems to, to deal with. So just channel that energy into that process is my request to you. Um, because I can promise you right now in Dallas, that ain't what they're doing. And, and it's, a, it's quite a mess on their hands. And so we're going to be a really good example of one of the fastest growing cities in the country. Um, and be able to do that better together. So I'm going to recess this for a few minutes, and then we're going to come back together. Uh, Jared, you good? Questions answered? I'm good. Okay, perfect. Let's recess and grab lunch. <clears throat> okay. I'm going to open back our budget work session. So just for audience listening and those here from staff, I think our game plan now is, um, first of all, appreciation to Stuart. Thank you so much for a very thorough presentation. I know a continued conversation. So we're going to sort of put a temporary bow on that discussion, allow staff to continue to work together, allow us to digest the full report, 
and schedule another session in one of the upcoming budget sessions we already have held on the calendar. So staff will come back around to y'all for that. Um, if you do have any questions, though, I would say they're specific for Stuart. You want to talk to him? Maybe just grab him offline. I know he's got to leave here at least in the next hour or so to catch his flight. But I'm sure he'd welcome any questions or specifics that you might need from him as he works with staff. Does that sound good to y'all? Awesome. And then our next presentation, we're going to move to transit initiatives. Um, and Rich Andreski is here, our president and CEO of Trinity Metro and a variety of other friends from, from Trinity Metro. Thank you all very much for joining us today. We really appreciate it. Thanks to all our fire friends that are leaving now. <laughs> Bye, fire. <laughs> Rich, the floor is yours. And I think Dana Bergdorf is going to appropriately introduce you. So good to see you. Mm -hmm. Of course. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, members of City Council. Dana Bergdorf, Assistant City Manager. I just wanted to take a moment to recognize Trinity Metro as a very important partner with the city in uh, implementing uh, various goals that we have, not just uh, in our FY23 budget, but uh, in, the, in the long term as well and helping to shape uh, the future of Fort Worth. So very happy to have Rich Andreski join us uh, this morning as President and CEO for Trinity Metro. I believe, Rich, you joined us four months ago with the two months ago, or maybe there was the announcement four months ago, but he's only been on the job two months. So, but yeah, so we'll, we'll expect a lot from you though, just from those, those two months of experience. But Rich comes to us from uh, the state of Connecticut, where he was the bureau chief for public transportation in the, the Connecticut DOT or Department of Transportation. So working with all different modes of public transportation with a variety of different transit agencies. So a lot of great experience that we welcome uh, here in Fort Worth, and I'm sure he was excited to experience drought and flood um, in the, the two months that, that he's been here in Fort Worth. But please join me in, in welcoming Rich. Thank you. Good morning. Dana, thank you so much. I've enjoyed getting to know you over these uh, few short months. Um, and uh, it's a pleasure to be with all of you, council members. Um, and I want to recognize two of our Trinity Metro board members here today, uh, Chris Nettles and Michael Crane. Um, a dual role as city council members and sitting on the Trinity Metro, Metro board. We also have Nick Genoa, uh, another board member here with us today in the audience. So not almost a quorum, but not quite. <laughs> um, I'd also like to start out, let me see if... Um, <laughs> well, I, you know, I do, I do want to say that I think it's been a huge win to have uh, city council on the Trinity Metro board. I think it's improved coordination, communication. Uh, my observation on two months on the job is I've heard a little scuttlebutt about uh, past uh, relationships between uh, the city and Trinity Metro. And I got to tell you, things seem to be working much better, at least from my perspective. And I see some nodding heads, so that's a good sign. <laughs> Um, also want to just introduce a few of my uh, team members with me today. We have Wayne Gensler, our Vice President of Bus Operations, uh, A.J. Arjunen, uh, VP of Rail Operations. We've got Fred Crosley, uh, our Chief Financial Officer, VP of Finance, and uh, Steve Montgomery, Director of Government Relations. And um, Chad Edwards would be here. I know you all love Chad, but Chad's got a personal obligation today. He couldn't make it. Um, he sends his regards. So a little, a little bit of history. Um, I always think it's good to do a little level setting. Uh, Trinity Metro has been around a long time. You know us as the T, uh, many of you. Um, we go way back to 1983. For the first 35 years of our history, we were more or less a, a, um, a bus transit provider. Um, we, we did partner with DART on uh, Trinity Railway Express, uh, but had a rather limited involvement in that. And we had some big aspirations, namely TexRail. And um, in 2013, there was this pivot. Um, the city, city got involved, as I understand it. There was a change in leadership at the board. And we got serious about TexRail in a hurry. And uh, the competency of Trinity Metro, still the T at that time, um, improved greatly. Uh, there was a change in not only the board, but change in executive leadership, starting with Paul Ballard in 2014, uh, retaining new talent to help us build out that TexRail system. And that all took place over the last uh, five to seven years. And I got to tell you, the, the caliber of the team in place today is extraordinary. I've, I've been in the industry 23 years. Um, I've 
actually had worked for different agencies, um, not only Connecticut, and I got to tell you, the team here is exceptional. Uh, big thinking, visionary, but also focused on the day-to-day, -day, focused on the customer. Uh, I've been on the job two months and um, really um, still in that listening, listening mode and, you know, listening to our stakeholders. Uh, you know, we're, we're doing a budget presentation here today, but I want to take a minute on vision. I think it's important to sort of take stock of the big picture before we drill down. Um, as I mentioned, you know, we're a multimodal agency now. We provide not only uh, TexRail and, and Trinity Metro bus service. We have Fort Worth bike share. We provide access, which is the paratransit service. Um, we have um, ZipZone, which is our newest and great, latest and greatest uh, on-demand transit service where you can, like an Uber, call, call for your transit ride to come pick you up. Um, really, the big question on my mind is what does Trinity Metro mean to all of you, the city and the county, and you know, how, are we, how do we fit in with the growth goals, the community, quality of life, mobility, equity, all of those topics, um, and that's a conversation. That's not an easy one-off one answer. That's, that's a complex answer that we hope to answer in terms of setting the goals for the next five and 10 years and beyond. Uh, transit's being disrupted. Many industries right now are being disrupted in a great and significant way, and, and transportation is, is also being disrupted. Uh, customer expectations are services should not, you shouldn't have to build your life around transit. You want to go, you want to get on a bus, you don't want to wait an hour for that next bus to show up. Um, on demand is the name of the game. It's, it's challenging to provide on demand, but we recognize um, that is the future. Um, so that also means high capacity transit is part of that equation, making sure that buses, at least in my opinion at this point, ought to run no less frequently than 30, every 30 minutes. Uh, probably more frequently, as, as often as every 5 to 10 to 15 minutes. Um, we're not there yet, but that's sort of a, a goal. The idea that you, you really shouldn't need a schedule to use public transportation. Um, you just show up at your bus stop and look down the road and see the, the headlights come in. And that's, that's sort of our aspirational uh, goal. And we're thinking big. Um, we're thinking big because a couple, a couple points on this. Um, we continue to grow at a record pace. Um, far exceeding most places in the country. Um, there's still lots of developable land. There's lots of residents moving in. Um, that's not showing any signs of slowing. Uh, Alliance is booming. Um, the amount of development taking place um, just requires some new thinking about how we move people about. And what we want to be careful of is having growth, cho you know, being a victim of our own success and ha having so much growth and so much population growth that uh, in 5, 10, or 15 years, it becomes impossible to move around easily. Um, so we're thinking big, and we really you know, want to get your input on that. Uh, a little bit about the state of the business today. Um, starts with the customer. The customers ride. Um, we used to have a saying, you know, choice customers versus non-choice customers, and that's sort of outmoded. The idea, people ride for all reasons. We have people riding because they don't own a car. We have people that prefer to take transit. We have um, people that choose to relocate to places because transit's available. Uh, we're listening to our customers. We need to be more responsive in terms of providing information and comfort for customers. So you'll see there on the, on the customer experience um, column, you know, some of our near-term initiatives, digital signs, real-time information, um, lighting, if you're out in a bus stop at night, you should have a light so the driver can see you and there's a, a degree of safety. Um, outreach is another big part of that. Cust it starts with the customers, but it really also it's making sure we're engaging with customers about their needs uh, and talking to our stakeholders, um, all of you. Uh, and, you know, and the partnerships that we have are also critically important. So it's not only the city of Fort Worth, but uh, downtown Fort Worth, Inc., um, the uh, Visit Fort Worth, other organizations that we partner with to provide services. Uh, those are critically important to us, not just in terms of dollars and cents, but because we, again, want to be responsive. We want to be providing service that is meaningful and that is not only serving customers, but is important to our, our stakeholders. Um, 
Mayor Matty, you talked about improving bus stops. That's top of our list. So facilities, we're going to get into that in a moment. I talked about zip zone. We want to be careful about expanding zip zone too quickly. Um, we're seeing great a great response to our zip zone service, but uh, I think the business model needs some refinement. We want to be careful about trying to provide this to all of Fort Worth and, and falling short on reliability or our, our financial goals there. So it's a work in progress. Uh, and vehicles, you know, we're, I think vehicles, uh, after bus stops, vehicles are what customers experience day in and day out, making sure that we have, um, you know, an up-to-date fleet. Um, notably, our TRE uh, rail fleet with DART is tired, so we need to do something with TRE. So that's on our long-term to-do list. I'm going to run through the budget numbers here. Uh, we can take a deeper dive, but I'll give you the sort of the top level. Um, so we carry about six million, or we're forecasted to carry about six million riders in the coming budget year. To do that, we're going to spend about 140 million dollars there in the bottom line, total expenses and reserves. Our in income, though, is you'll see at the top line there, total revenue, 255 million. Um, some of you might ask, well, geez, you're, you're spending 140, but you're getting, you know, incoming revenue is 255. Well, the difference there is that we rely on that revenue to fund our capital program. And our capital program is lumpy. We don't spend, like operations, we have a consistent cash burn every day, every, every month. Um, it's different with capital. Depending on the projects we're undertaking, we might see a a higher need for you know uh, spending capital versus um, when projects are winding down or in between projects. Yeah. So this is our five-year um, look. You'll see there the budget column, the third column from the left, uh, 140 million there in operating expenses. Uh, what you'll see there is capital expenditures down below, uh, midway down the chart, uh, in in the current. Upcoming budget year, uh, fiscal 23, we're forecasted to spend $106 million. Uh, so what you'll see down the bottom, sort of a bottom line look there, is uh, ending funding available. So our, our funding balance currently um, is forecast to end the year next year with $80 million. What you'll see over the five-year lookout is that uh, we, we spend down fairly quickly, and that's a, a, in large part due to the construction of TexRail to the near south side medical district, and um, we, uh, it's worth noting that we cannot take on debt. So uh, we have a, a, a limit around what kind of debt we can take on and, and how it's, it's really short, short term, not long term uh, debt. And so we have to cash flow these investments. Um, so when we talk about new priorities and new directions for Trinity Metro, we have to be mindful that we have to keep a certain reserve in place to fund operations, number one. Number two, a certain reserve in place to fund our long-range capital program. And recognizing that there are many variables right now um, that could cause us to have increased expenses. Uh, we know fuel is highly volatile. We know that um, construction and labor are also uh, subject to inflationary pressures. So, um, you know, we're going to end this five-year period with nine, $9.4 million in reserve. That's a, a razor's edge. So we have to watch. And as we think about the future of Trinity Metro, um, uh, I guess what I'm getting to here is if we want to be bolder and think bolder, we're going to need to talk about revenue at some point. But we're not going to get into that today unless you'd like to. Rich, just a quick question. What are your um, legal limitations or parameters around reserves and what you can carry over? every year? Is it, does the legislature allow for however much money you have left in reserves, or do you have to return some of that to taxpayers? No, uh, we don't have to uh, re return the reserve to taxpayers. Uh, there are obligated funds in our program, so they're, when we say surplus or reserve, it's really a, a – it, they're, they're, in, in fact, uh, we have future obligations against those dollars. Okay. We have an obligation to keep $10 million in a reserve, a cash reserve account. Okay. Um, and the rest can be kind of undedicated for future projects the next year. Yes. Okay. Yep. Go ahead, Carlos. Okay. Uh, you have a question, and you know, you bring up um, looking at other revenue sources. Has Trinity Metro looked at applying uh, for federal competitive funds? 
at all. I think it's a 5307 type of uh, money catch-all based on population. Yeah, no, great question. I appreciate the question. Um, so we, uh, yes, number one, we get 5307 funds every year. Yeah. Those are uh, form what, what's known as formula funding through the Federal Transit Administration. We also go after discretionary grants like the BUILD grant program. We were successful in getting a BUILD grant to double track and assist with construction of Trinity Lake Station um, in partnership with NCT COG. So uh, yes, we do go after discretionary programs. There's funding right now um, out there for you know, rail cars, for accessibility programs, for um, operation support. There's lots of different, we, we, we keep a close watch on that. And, and um, yeah, absolutely. Um, no, leaving no stone unturned. Yep. Thank you. But I think for this council, I know it's hard because we've looked at numbers all day. <laughs> but if you look at FY27, you're trying to draw attention, Rich, to that ending fund balance available is below the 10 million you need in a reserve fund. And you're just drawing attention to the concern of we have to plan better for what that looks like in future fiscal years. Yes, it's, there's a, there's very, yes. Okay. Yeah, well said. Okay. Yep. Um, yeah, aspirationally, if we think about expanding zip zone, for example, or we think about increased service on our bus routes, those dollars are not accounted for here in this program. Mm -hmm. uh, and even you'll see in a slide or two, you'll see even bus stops, signs, and shelters are funded, but not maybe to the level that we'd like. Okay. So this is a, a fairly lean, I know we talk about hundreds of millions, it, may not seem that way, but there are a lot of goals and priorities, and, and um, we, we would like to come back to this at some point and have a larger conversation about, you know, how, how big should Trinity Metro grow, grow to support the, the city? I, I will tell you that we spend about $89 per capita per year. Um, we lag just about every peer city out there. Um, Akron, Ohio spends more. Cincinnati spends more. Uh, Akron spends about $94 a year. We spend 89. So even, a even little old Akron. Um, <laughs> so, and you know, we're, a, we're, a, um, uh, we, it's one benchmark to, to, to take stock of. Um, certainly we, we don't necessarily have to be the largest on a per capita basis, but my, my impression is that just, um, the, we know talent is mobile. We know people make locational decisions based on quality of life, access to jobs, opportunity. And, you know, I'm, I'm an example of that, right? I moved moved here, um, and I, 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 it, it makes a difference. People consider that in their locational decisions. And if we're going to support, you know, more growth, more corporate headquarters, more technology investment, R&D, um, you know, that workforce is looking for mobility. They're looking for ease of getting around. Sometimes that's a car, but sometimes it's public transportation. Here, here are the top sort of priorities. I have to tell you, this, this program doesn't fully reflect a, a new direction. Some of these are con continuation of prior commitments. Um, about half of the program is dedicated to our rail side, and rail is a, more capital intensive. So continuing to invest in, in um, upgrade TRE service, uh, extending text rail to the medical district. Um, but we have quite a bit uh, in our program for our bus customers as well. Uh, security enhancements, uh, improved bus stops. These dollar amounts are not totals. They're the dollars that we expect to spend during fiscal 23. Um, the programs are much larger potentially than what you see here. It's just this is a, a snapshot for, for the one fiscal year. Are there any questions on this? I have one. Uh, when it comes to uh, bus stops and shelter replacements, um, for example, in my district, there's one on Texas 199. In my opinion, it's not in a very safe spot. I wouldn't want to wait on a bus there. I mean, there's no shelter. There's not much room there to begin with. Um, how often do you perform, I guess, an assessment or an audit of where you have shelters and where you need them because what I see there's shelter replacements but not shelter additions or am I reading too much into that um, great question so 
I'm going to get to that in a moment in terms of our shelter program. I can tell you that we are taking in a, a complete inventory. Uh, we have an inventory. We're updating that inventory. We're looking at um, the full range of conditions that are stopped. So is there a shelter? Is there a sign? Is there um, accessibility, um, shelter, uh, lighting? Uh, and our, our intention there is to touch every bus stop in the next three years. So every single bus stop throughout the city will be inspected, upgraded in some way, shape, or form, including signage. We want to introduce QR codes, for example. So if you have a smartphone, all you have to do is hold your phone up to the QR code, and it'll connect you to the real-time information. Where's my bus? But we'll, we'll, we're going to take a deeper dive in a moment. Oops. All right. So, okay. Thank you. Yep. I was going to ask Carlos a question. Oh. <laughs> Instead, you made a mess. And I made a mess over here. But when you were talking about safety, uh, you, is it crime-related or is it like standing in an area where... No, not crime-related, Chris. I'm talking about location, location. safety. Yeah, and just so, standing there because they're on 199. I'm so sorry. Uh, the speed limit is posted at 45, but people don't abide by 45. They come in at a pretty fast clip. And... You don't have a shelter or place to sit down. There's a bus stop sign. Right. My point is, maybe we ought to look at that. So. Okay. Richard, so I think, I'm sorry. And so I think, I guess the question is, do we look at, for the future, if relocating that location to better make it safe or... Well, I, I can add to that. Okay. I can give you some, some history. Carlos, at one point in time, the T was so... I'll just say customer friendly. You could call and say, we need a bus stop right here. And there would be one. And there wouldn't be any, a lot of research put into it. They just plop them down. And that was, the, those were the inefficiencies that predate you. And when, when you take a look at a bus stop like that, if it's been there a long time, that person who requested it, and it could be just one person, and they would put it there. And so the, the assessment that I think we're going to hear about will add a level of sophistication that we hadn't seen before. I used to be on your board. Long time yeah. ago. <laughs> you know a thing or two, right? <laughs> well, we're, we're going to look forward to working with each of you in your uh, respective districts. Um, that certainly, so there's a number of factors. There's certainly the objective uh, operational, how many customers, what's the condition of the stop. There are other factors. Is the stop located near a hospital, a child care center? Is it near a school? There are other dimensions to this. So um, more, to, more to come on that. System-wide ridership, we, um, we took a bit of a hit. I think you all know this. Uh, ridership uh, was historically much higher. Uh, COVID happened. That changed quite a bit. Um, what sort of... What you're seeing here is the gray is sort of is the trend line. You'll see that big drop in 2020 with COVID. The blue is last year's ridership, and the red is this year's ridership. And we're decidedly higher, consistently higher. Riders are coming back. It's not they're not the same riders we lost. Some of the riders that used to commute every day, five days a week, they're commuting maybe fewer days per week, or some of them have moved to full-time telework, uh, but we're getting new riders. So some of those new riders are folks taking advantage of TexRail to get to the airport or to come downtown. Uh, TexRail is growing significantly. We have, bottom line here is we have 30% more riders this year versus last year. So Rich, just so I can mm -hmm. speak publicly and not mess up, if you look at your FY2022 numbers as of July, are those 507,000 unique riders, or is that 507 rides? Rides. Okay, thank you. Sure. Our, our bus system, um, we, you know, about three and four, roughly three and four riders are bus riders. Uh, That's still our primary business, although rail is growing quickly. Um, we have 20% more riders on bus year over year, and we believe about 15 points of those 20 uh, are attributable to our, a better bus connection. So that was our restructuring of many of our routes. We had routes that meandered and tried to do too many things and serve too many areas, didn't serve anyone particularly well. We have now routes like the number 15 that operates from Central Station to the Northside Station through, you know, across Panther Island and uh, the stockyards. 
that route is an example of you know a higher performing route now, um, simplified, easier to use and understand. Um, also frequency. So the routes that have higher frequencies are performing better, as you would expect. Uh, so bottom line, 20% more riders year over year, and the trend the trend line continues to go in a positive direction. I, mean, I just would make a comment to what Mayor Pro Tem Biven said. A lot of that was restructuring. So some some stops were taken off and consolidated, et cetera, as part of that overall. And I know it was a four-year time, but um, that was also something they looked at to make a better connection. Um, yeah, thank you for thank you for that, Michael. Yeah, it's um, the the better connection is an example of, of sort of a close working relationship with the city. Um, you know, there's there's been a lot of good planning that's happened to date, which has allowed us to make some of these improvements. Um, and that's that's another topic of discussion: making sure our pipeline, both you know, our planning, our service, and our capital projects, we we have a robust pipeline. And continue to you know make improvements going forward. Uh, the dash, dash has suffered from West Seventh Street to be candid. Um, we've had a lot of delays on the dash. Not <laughs> so ridership there, ridership there is middling. Uh, we'll get back. We'll, we'll get back to um, business. You know once once. Um, and, and I got to tell you, there's been occasions. I know Wayne can speak to this, where the Fort Worth and Western Railroad blocked the crossing on West Seventh and. That that doesn't help ridership either, so. But but the dash is important, and we're going to talk more about you know the original vision of the dash, which was not only the cultural uh, district connection, but other other dash routes. And Texrail, Texrail is a super performing service for us. Texrail is we had our third all time best month in July, and we are almost getting close to our all-time record, probably because December is typically a big month for us. Um, I have a feeling that this December we're going to, you know, break some records. Um, and here's TexRail sort of without the overlapping lines. So this is the entire history of TexRail since opening day. You'll see COVID really hit us. Um, we're also subject to the weather. But what you'll notice about the overall trend line is that People are discovering us. Um, I'm, I'm still surprised. Um, I back to school night last night, and I talked to somebody that commutes out of DFW for work, and had no idea TexRail existed. Or, and when I explained it and explained we have a long-term parking, um, he immediately said, "Well, why why wouldn't I do that? I'm going to do that next week." So I, I just I don't think everyone's fully aware of of the services we offer. Do you have in, internally as staff, do you have a goal in mind of where you'd like to be that's attainable for, for monthly ridership? I, I like I like the, the million the million trips goal. Um, okay. Right now we're at, we're on like sort of in the six hundred thousand range. Uh, mil, a million annual trips would be roughly thirty two hundred boardings a day. Okay. And we're currently at um, six seventeen hundred. Yeah, I'm looking at my team there. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Am I right? 18, 18, 1800. Um, I think I think we can get there. Um, we look at the number of employments, uh, you know, the, the activity at the airport. Um, I'd love to grab one percent of those trips, which I think is reasonable. Um, one one percent of those trips plus increasing the commutation to downtown. Mm -hmm. um, there's going to be a lot of development in housing around Central Station. Uh, coming online in the next few years, we those those should be really transit riders that are living across the street from the train. Um, so I, yeah, I think it's very attainable. I would say a million trips with it, within five years, maybe maybe within three, is possible. And we're leading the pack. Um, so among all the transit systems in Texas, uh, including Capital Metro, um, Houston Metro, and others. Um, we we have 73% of our riders back on the system. That that compares with um, Dart, which is around 65%. So we're we're doing really well right now, and um, I think it's a it's a credit to the whole team. We're we're really going above and beyond to try to reach customers, marketing, um, customer service, um, providing really a, a first class customer experience as as much as we can without you know additional investment. 
I'm sorry, before I pivot to our programs, any, any questions? Okay, I can, uh, we, this is sort of the overview of the major highlights and priorities for this coming fiscal year. Number one, top of the list is bus stops. We talked about that a little bit. Um, NCT COG has agreed to provide a million dollars to assist with accessibility, building out the concrete pads. Um, we're gonna be dedicating seven million, uh, six million of that seven million. Um, it's works out to about $3,800 a bus stop. That is not nearly enough, it's a start. So what we're looking at is every bus stop ought to have a place, a place to get information, number one. So a sign, QR code that links to real-time information. Number two, it should have a, uh, every, every bus stop should have a place to sit. So if we don't have a shelter, there should be at least a bench attached to the sign. Um, we also want a light at every stop. And we can do this without utility work. We can do this through, you know, solar solar lighting. And um, I guess I would I would sort of put the challenge out there that we would love to partner further on this topic. And I can sort of kick off that partnership by inviting all of you. Uh, if you'd like to join me, I'll be out on October 22nd with our team. We'll be up and down um, our bus routes throughout the city. We'll be doing bus stop cleanup day. It's fun, it's actually not a whole day, it's a morning. We'll have breakfast, um, come on over to Central Station and we'll get we'll get in a car and we'll go out. And um, I think it's a, it'll be a fun, yeah, go ahead. I'll, I'll give you my idea that syncs with that. I, I really hadn't thought of a bus stop cleanup. Probably won't be a volunteer for that. But I think what you should do is invite all of us to take the bus to work one day, you know, pick, pick a week. That's always been real successful in terms of raising awareness. And if you get the mayor, and I know you will, they'll all follow her to work if, if you had a real job. Can't, can't buoy bus. Let's yeah. do it. So that, that, that's an idea that's been volunteer. very successful. But she's not going to clean up, but I'm going to ride the bus. Is that what I just heard? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And you, you can get Jared to ride the bus somewhere, all of us, wherever we work. And you'll, you'll get a lot of media coverage on that. I was going to save that, but when you talked about cleaning up, I thought I'd put that in there now. I love it. I would love to join you, too. So okay. just name the date, and I'll be there. Okay. Any, any questions on this one? If you could just, I'm going to look at your staff because I know they're going to do it. If you could send us the digitals for the bus cleanup day um, to share and, and, and do that, yeah. And I'm and I'm gonna get Miss Bivens out there. She's gonna <laughs> she's gonna be out there with me. Yeah. Uh, Rich, when oh. you think about sorry bus stop improvements, do you and it's a three year seven million dollar program. You already spoke to every bus stop will get evaluated and some improvements made. But how do you meet the times of what what riders are wanting? I mean, are you completely renovating some of our our most used bus stops? You and I have talked a lot about, I can't stand to see someone trying to find a shade tree in 110 degree heat waiting for the bus. And so I just, I just wonder, and I think this is an important conversation. I know Kelly works on this daily. Thank you, Kelly. Um, on how the city can be better partnered, especially from an infrastructure standpoint. I'm just, I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm assuming $7 million is not near what you would need to improve every bus stop the way we'd like to see them. And, uh, Mayor, that's exactly right. Um, we're, we're going to prioritize, and some stops will get a higher level of investment. Um, I think, without without actually seeing the the, the data from our, our inventory, m my best estimate right now is two to three times this amount is probably required to do to do the program justice. Mm -hmm. um, we are going to prioritize stops with higher volumes. There there are stops that have as few as one or two people per day. There are other stops that have potentially fifty or more boardings per day. So we are going to focus in on those stops that have higher activity. I got to, you know, the photo that's here is sort of a middle of the road, right? It, there's a, there's a shelter. There's nothing exciting about that bus stop. Um, so a, a bus stop like this, if it were a higher volume bus stop might warrant a larger shelter. It might warrant actually a real time bus sign. They're making signs now that are solar powered that provide cellular connectivity. Uh, so mm -hmm. we're going to be working through that, but I got to tell you, $3,800 doesn't go very far. 
um, when you're talking about capital. Mm -hmm. It's um, thank you. Did that I answer good. your question? It did. Yes, thank okay. you. And I believe it was in your district, but I could be wrong. We had some folks come to council and talk about a neighborhood specific uh, bus stop re revamp that they wanted to do. I thought it was really innovative because it was unique to that neighborhood. And so um, is there any room for capacity building on that particular type of project? Because, you know, I look at that um, that bus stop and I think, well, if it were in front of Cook Children's, I'd paint it blue because it would look like their roof. Or if it was on Camp right. Bowie, you know, we would pay homage to the bricks or, mm -hmm. you know, whatever it is. And so is there any room to 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 build that program so that our neighborhoods can um, take some ownership and maybe some pride and hopefully increase some ridership. I I love the question because yes, I think I think we need to do that. Um, one of the one of the ideas we've been talking about is doing a a challenge, a, a program where we put out a RFP of to, to solicit ideas for bus stops, and then do some model model bus stop development, and maybe there are modules or panels that can be uh, swapped out with local art artwork or or different a different color palette, um, something scalable though is sort of our goal here is something that's quick and easy to replace repair and replace, uh, something that's fairly affordable. Um, our goal is not only to touch all 1,700 bus stops, but to do that on a regular basis after the three-year program. So if, if a shelter gets damaged, if there's a broken glass or a car hits a shelter, we, we need the ability to be able to get out there. And But yes, I think it's a great idea. Michael. No, and, and just to adding to that, somewhere at Trinity Metro is a 2017 Leadership Fort Worth uh, bus competition finalist that won, and it was a kid, I think, out of maybe Dunbar or some high school that we partnered with near Southside and Trinity Metro to do design competition and very excited about it, and then nothing ever got done with it. So I'll say somewhere there's a, re a report of a really cool bus stop design that we put out, and it was a fun project to work on. It was my group with Leadership Fort Worth. But that's been out there, and I think it's a it's a kind of a cool idea to incorporate neighborhoods and bring that to fruition. Think about, like, the utility boxes where you see art throughout the city. Mm -hmm. Carlos. Sorry, Rich, we're lots of questions. Rich, one more question. Uh, since we are talking about things uh, uh, pertaining to ridership, and, you know, for a while, Council has expressed to Trinity Metro the desire to increase that ridership. Um, I seem to recall from 2021, the council had expressed a desire for Trinity Metro to better track ridership. What what has changed since then to now? How are you tracking ridership, and how has that improved over the course of that year? And I'll I'll, I'll give you my my answer, and then Wayne, I'll, I'll look, and you can correct me. <laughs> We have uh, automatic passenger counters um, and our fare box data. Uh, we have a daily count that we get um, on on both the bus and the rail system. Uh, the buses are automated. I believe the rail is a hand count. Uh, the train crews are out on every train lift, um, taking tickets from customers. Um, we have very good accountability on ridership, and that's required for the Federal Transit Administration. We have to report that um, every year, and that goes back to the question on formula funds. Our formula funding from the federal government it relies on those ridership counts. So those ridership counts um, go into a, a formula, and we share in the in the in the in the funding available for our our region. TexRail, TexRail is, um, again, we're doing really well in TexRail, but we have, I think you all know this, a, a near south side extension to the medical district, six, uh, 40,000 some odd jobs. Um, we have a, an extension there that's in the works. Actually, tomorrow we're going to be taking proposals from firms to provide program management services. And then later this year, we're going to be uh, hiring a, an engineering firm to do final design. Good news here, I mentioned those, re those funding reserves. We have currently $167 million allocated in our program for this extension. Um, you'll see the breakdown there, um, including the, the 
the city's participation. Um, major, major project for a whole variety of reasons. Um, certainly opens up access to lots of lots of employment. A lot of coordination with external part parties. This is one of the reasons this extension didn't get built in the first phase. Um, there's a lot of coordination with UP and Fort Worth and Western, in particular. Um, you know, our current best estimate right now is that this would open for service in late 2026. Another major uh, rail initiative is what, what is known as this NT Moves Build Grant. This is the, the grant I was alluding to earlier, uh, 25 million um, <clears throat> coming from the federal government, a total of 72 million being invested. It's going to take um, the railroad and really make it a double track railroad for four miles. So there's two miles of additional double track taking place here, um, which will provide operational flexibility, schedule improvement, meaning more flexible scheduling because now we have two tracks. It'll reduce freight train interference. We, we've struggled as of late. TexRail has been a star performer. TRE, not so much. Uh, TRE has suffered from reliability issues, some of it mechanical, some of it freight train interference, some of it um, the loss of riders due to downtown employment, especially in Dallas, dropping off. But um, this, this project, um, again, a partnership with NCT COG, it includes a, you'll see a line item there of, for 13 million for this clear path technology. What clear path technology is, is that the freight trains that come through Fort Worth um, uh, come from all parts of the greater region. And the conflicts with passenger rail through this software can be mitigated. So a train that might be 50 miles away can be held back a little bit, creating a slot for the passenger rail service and better manage the flow of trains through through the region. Um, any questions on this program? Oh, it, I'm sorry, it also supports uh, the, the Trinity Lake Station project. And there's the, uh, the schedule revenue operations in, in uh, September of 27. That uh, Trinity Lake Station comes online much sooner. This is for full completion of that um, train dispatching program. Trinity Lake Station is, um, we had an opportunity to go out, uh, many of us, uh, board and senior staff, to go look at Trinity Lake Station. Foundation work is complete. Um, there's quite a bit of activity. The second track is being installed. This will relocate the station that's currently at Richland Hills at Eaterville Road and move it down not a mile or so down the track to, to this location, which is tied in closely with the, the development that's taking place. Yes, yes. It's, uh, we're, we're really proud, of, uh, proud of, the, of, the, of the new station coming on. It gives a chance for us to reach new, new customers. Richland Hills Station did not see much development. So um, it's mostly parking around that location. This location will be anchored by residential mixed use development. And uh, we're, we're looking forward to it. Um, station opens uh, a little more than a year from now. And if I may add, just so you guys know, when, when Ken finishes this development, we're talking 3,000 homes. And I think he's at about 1,800 now, and we're talking, you know, mixed development, retail, commercial, and you'll be just minutes away from the airport. It's going to be amazing. So it's Trinity Boulevard and 820, y'all come. Thank you. High intense. So we'll just, now that we talked about rail, we'll, we'll go to bus. Um, I mentioned Alliance. Uh, I think you all know the commitment that's been made to improve access to opportunity and alliance. There's this a new program, high intensity bus, basically a guaranteed, I lost my screen here, let's see. As long, I guess as long as you're seeing it. Um, we'll run from the Dr. Dennis Duncan's transfer center um, into downtown and then up I-35 in the managed lanes to our North Park and Ride. 
um, fast, frequent service, guaranteed arrivals. So this is new for our region, perhaps for the state, um, where our advertised arrival time will be guaranteed. If we're late, we will refund the customer their fare. So pretty, pretty innovative. Uh, we think the reason we're confident in doing that is because of the managed lanes. We have the ability, pretty much we know those managed lanes will flow um, nicely, and so we can, we can offer that guarantee. Oh, two more things. Uh, this, these are being operated with accessible coach-style buses that you might see on a charter service. They're fully accessible. They're also electric. Um, and um, we're expecting them, the service to start in 2025. Reason we can, we're not starting it sooner is uh, there's a, a considerable lead time on the buses. So we just have to, we, we, um, it's going to be a couple years before we have those buses on the property. And this is to connect um, people to jobs. Yes, very much so. Okay. Yep. And then we have sort of our basic campaign every year to maintain our assets. So uh, you'll see here we have $7.2 million allocated, uh, basic upkeep of our facilities. Nothing terribly exciting here except to say part of the business is making sure we're caring for those public assets, right? So painting a signage concrete repair and that's that's ongoing and then one of my favorites is the high capacity transit corridor um, we have seen really exciting things I've been on the phone quite a bit with my counterparts throughout the country just spoke with the, the CEO of Indigo in Indianapolis a few days ago about their experience and she flat out told me this has been a huge driver of economic development. Companies have, so, have intentionally located near these high capacity transit stations. Um, it's not, we're not calling it bus because these vehicles can be like rail. They can operate with distant spacing between bus stops in, in dedicated lanes. They can look like rail. They can have uh, tram-like features um, with doors on both sides. So very much um, an innovative program. It's coupled with traffic signal, uh, transit signal priority. Um, and we're really looking forward to working with the city on this and NCT COG. There's quite a bit of work to do before we're ready to design it. There's still some questions about where in Lancaster Avenue it runs, which lanes it runs in and occupies, where the stations are going to be built, what features will the stations have, we want to get that right. We're spending, you know, this is a this is this is a you know a rail level of investment in terms of uh, the infrastructure. Oh, do we have do we have audio? Maybe. So th before we watch this video, I want to say um, those those are the highlights. There's quite a bit more to our our program, as you would imagine. Um, again, this program does not reflect a new direction yet. This is sort of what I'll call an interim or a transitional year, um, at least the way I'm looking at it, and that there's some big, big things ahead. And, um, you know, we'll be coming back to you to talk about, um, right now I'll, I'll say we're in sort of in a conversational stage about the future of Trinity Metro. We're going to get a little bit more formal next year and start to put pen to paper and really come up with, you know, the next master plan for the agency. So looking forward to working with you on that. So bringing back the riders, we're, we're starting an advertising campaign. I'm going to end on the video. Customers are not totally aware that we exist. 22% of, of survey participants recognized Trinity Metro. 78% didn't know who we were. Um, the question was posed, do you know who the, who the transit provider is of, of Tarrant County or City of Fort Worth? 78% or, yeah, 78% did not know. So clearly we have a, a mind share, you know, a, an awareness issue out there, which is probably holding us back in terms of ridership. So uh, we, we're starting this campaign. It's called our TM campaign. And the program is built on the idea that getting the, getting 
people to know at least that we exist. So let's see if this. So you'll see that in print uh, too. It'll be on a lot of billboards and benches uh, throughout the city. Great presentation, Rich. Quick, quick council questions. Go ahead, Gina. I, I took some notes to, to share with you, Richard, and I'll send these to you. I already told you about the idea of utilizing public officials to use a bus to go to work. Uh, another idea to raise ridership, and it's very impressive the numbers you showed, but you might want to make a presentation to the executive roundtable here and get them to include information about Trinity Metro in the employee orientation packets and the annual health signups. Uh, when I went to work in Dallas, uh, writing, getting the easy pass was part of my orientation. And I think you're bringing new momentum to the organization. Uh, the other thing that I would suggest that, that you consider is you know, always make sure people know the difference in pay, the disparity, because we see dark, light rail over here. Nobody comprehends there's a full penny, full cent going toward them, as opposed to over here you only get half a penny because we use the other half cent to fund CCPD, the crime control district. And I would always make sure, and, and you know, you never know, you may get people to give more money in some other format, but people don't really understand the difference in funding. And the final thing I'll share with you is I hope you guys can incorporate the historic wall into some format of Black History Month. Uh, the wall has been there. It was part of the bringing the TRE into downtown Fort Worth. But it's a, just so you all know, it's a, it's a clay pictorial exhibit of Black history in Fort Worth from the 1800s to now. And I have a stake in it because I did the voiceover. But very few people really know about it. And it's just like they don't know about, you know about Trinity Metro. But those are some things that I think would be very, very helpful, but especially getting employers to promote Trinity Metro because they do it big time over in Dallas, and you've got an audience right here. And again, it was part of my orientation when I went to work for Encore. So that's all I offer. It's a great presentation. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. Good. Any other questions, Council for Rich? They need to. No. Rich, thank you very much for the update. Okay, sorry, Chris. Go no, ahead. I don't have any questions. I just want to uh, appreciate Rich and his good leadership and the staff that are here and the staff that we're working with. I truly believe um, Trinity Metro is on the road to do some great things. I was on the right track. Uh, Michael and I have a couple of TM that we're going to add to there. We won't say that now. Uh, we've been working on um, so, yeah, I can only imagine. And so I would just challenge, I met with Rich, is that and I think uh, Mayor has mentioned a couple times, you know, how the city can partner and either, even more than what we're doing now. Um, and that may not, whatever that looks like. And so we appreciate your leadership and look forward to working uh, things moving forward. Thank you, Chris. Um, any other questions from council? No. Rich, thank you to you and staff for preparing such a thorough presentation. We're very excited that you're here in Fort Worth. Thank you for relocating your family from Connecticut. I haven't gotten to meet your wife yet, but I'll get to do that and say thank you to her as well. So your kids started a new school. I hope they're enjoying that. Um, we're very excited to work with you. There's a lot of exciting things in our future, thanks to y'all's leadership. So appreciate it. Thank, thank you so much, Mayor Maddie and, and council. Thank you. Yep. Okay, David. Looks Mayor, like our next presentation is school safety. School safety, and we're going to call on Chief Noakes, and I think he's got a cast with him. Chief?
Mayor and Council, we want to thank you for your time today to talk about another very important topic, uh, talk about our school safety and our school resource officer unit. One thing I want to start with is uh, I think a lot of people are unaware of just how many ISDs we have that touch the city of Fort Worth. Right now we've got 15 different ISDs listed here in alphabetical order who have at least one school in Fort Worth. One of the questions we had is, in addition to ISDs, would it be possible for Fort Worth PD to have SROs within charter schools and private schools? So we are working with the city attorney's office to get a final determination on where we are allowed to be without violating any regulations or laws. To this point, we understand any open enrollment charter school, we are allowed to have officer presence there. We're looking at other charter schools and private schools as well to confirm that, and we'll get a response to you on that as soon as we're able to determine it. All we would ask is it would be the same agreement we have with the ISDs, with the same cost uh, sharing agreement, and we would be happy to work with it whatever school districts the city determined they would like us in. As far as our participating ISDs, we have several. Uh, obviously, our largest is going to be Fort Worth ISD. Uh, our annual contract with them is over $4 million. It's what they provide to us to provide SROs in their school. That includes 12 high schools, 22 middle schools, with the total between those two of over 28,000, about 29,000 students. A total of about 42 SROs. And then you see on the far right column, the ratio. We like to keep that ratio below 1,000 per one student, but we actually will work with between uh, 1,500 to one student ratio. Uh, smallest obviously being Lena Pope, but that gives a breakdown not only of the sizes of the schools we're serving, but the number of school resource officers that we have in those schools. So what is a school resource officer? This is the official definition. A school resource officer is a full-time law enforcement officer with sworn law enforcement authority, trained in school-based policing and crisis response, assigned by the employing law enforcement agency to work with the school using community-oriented policing concepts. What's the purpose? So for us, the City of Fort Worth provides school resource officers for the purpose of creating a safe, educational environment. We do that in partnership with the various districts that employ us. And the partnership is something we're gonna to touch on a little bit later. We brought someone with us who we partner with in Fort Worth ISD who can expand on just how important those partnerships are. NASRO, that's the National Association of School Resource Officers. They teach the triad model when it comes to the duties of a school resource officer in a school. We know they are law enforcement officers. That's the easy part. But they're also educators. Our school resource officers spend a lot of time in classrooms with students and also with the educators to give different uh, presentations on safety and other things we'll, we'll discuss in a later slide. But they're also informal count counselors and mentors for these students. And this is where the relationship building that takes time to build trust is really at the heart of what the SROs are doing. When it comes to the cases that they work, they are police officers. They, they do enforce the laws that the state of Texas requires. Now, when they're on, they're assigned to a school, we expect them to be on campus. We expect them to be visible. And what this will do is help deter crime on those campuses. They'll investigate and file charges for criminal offenses with the students. Uh, if it occurs on their school campus during school hours or in the, on a bus, transporting children. If it happens to be a case involving an adult, after they investigate it, we'll actually have one of our standard criminal investigators handle the case rather than our youth unit. This gives you an idea of the kind of criminal enforcement that has to be taken. And I'm gonna tell you right now that last number, that's an extreme outlier. And I'm looking to make sure there's not an error in the number of weapons that were seized so we put that on there because that's the data we have right now, but I want to confirm that and get back with you to make sure that's right. Because if you look at weapons over those four separate school years, six, five, 16, 730. 
Now, I did speak with our two rock star SROs who are here with us today. And uh, actually, I don't mean to put you on the spot, Officer Judd, but you did, when I brought this up earlier, you brought up some of the behaviors you're seeing post-COVID behaviors with students and maybe how they're pushing the boundaries a little bit. Would you mind explaining the same thing to this group, please? Sure. <clears throat> I'm Ethan Judd. I'm an officer with Fort Worth Police Department. I've been a school resource officer. This is my now 10th year in the unit. I've been a police officer for 15 years at Arlington Heights High School. Um, I can't speak to the veracity of these statistics. I didn't compile them, but what I can say is that what I've seen anecdotally is we've seen a lot more juvenile misbehavior in the schools post-COVID because the kids were uh, basically spent a year off at home, either remotely uh, learning or doing some, some uh, version of uh, mixed, remote, and in-person learning. And uh, we saw a big push in the juvenile misbehavior. Again, I can't speak to the veracity of those. I know personally um, I have seen an increase in weapons on campus, and uh, it's, it's not something that I'm happy that is happening, but I think that the more referrals and the more searches and the more we enhance our enforcement uh, to provide a safe environment, um, I think it's going to be a productive resolution uh, for those students and for the campus. Thank you. I appreciate that, sir. Here's the cases they don't work. A lot of people aren't aware. So Senate Bill 393 was introduced in 2013 by State Senator Royce West. We've all heard of the pipeline to prison, which was referred to when it came to SROs and their presence in schools. Some felt it was just a way for us to put juveniles in the criminal justice system when that is actually the last thing we want to do. So Senate Bill 393 forbids police from issuing citations for misbehavior in school. So like a Class C citation. That doesn't include traffic violations. That includes Class C misdemeanors on campus. Now, this is designed to keep children out of the criminal justice system for low-level offenses, and that's where this, the school district's responsibility to step up and take care of that kind of low-level behavior. I have a question. Yes, ma'am. So when the school district administers um, discipline, do the school resource officers then step in at a later date to determine if there's a criminal offense or is the school district given the deference first? I saw you step up. Did you want to take that? So during the investigations that happen for any juvenile misbehavior that would be classified as a class C or the lowest level of misdemeanor offense, we do our investigations concurrently. We work with administrators to determine if it meets the elements of an offense for a high level look charge or if it is going to be classified as a school offense, which would be juvenile misbehavior of class C nature, and therefore subject to their discretion and administrative discipline rather than uh, us issuing a citation. So I guess the answer to your question would be that the investigations run concurrently. We work in cooperation with our administrators and staff to make sure that we're addressing all aspects of it to see where it falls before we make a determination. So would it be... Um one or the other in the sense of if if the school administers, say the school um, puts them in, de uh, what is it called? In-house detention, yeah. yeah. Um, if they make that determination, then that's, we're not going back and, and looking at stuff, right? Mm. No. Are we sure? No. Once the school makes their decision, that's the school's decision. We don't look forward into that. Unless it becomes criminal, then we get involved in it. If the school says we're going to put them in ISS so we're going to suspend them, just, we let the school handle it. Hmm. Okay. Gina. Chief, can you go back to that slide <laughs> with Senator Royce West on there? Now, if, if officers cannot issue citations for misbehavior in schools, can officers still take a kid to Kimball Road? Or yes, ma'am. If it's a higher level offense, one that uh, someone would normally be arrested for, uh, say a class A misdemeanor or a felony, obviously, yes, they could be taken to Kimbo. Now, when it, when it comes to the history, the records, you know, of, of that student, you know, who was taken away, are those sealed because they're juveniles and will they remain sealed? Or what happens to the future of that child who was taken away? Once they become an adult, and if you want to expand on it, please, please do so, that's when records would be sealed. The, any, any juvenile record would be sealed. So that means it's uh, even when they turn 18, they don't have to worry about that? They should not have to worry about that. Okay. 
I'm still confused as to how it's the school's authority, but the officer can take the student away without issuing a citation. Well, well as I said, if it's uh, something that would just be a Class C misdemeanor, then that's the school's, that can be the, just the school's responsibility. And they can but, ask the officer to take the kid away. Well, if it's a higher level offense, we're not going to take them for a Class C offense. If it's a higher level offense, if the investigation determines it's actually higher than a Class C, okay. then yes, an arrest can take place. Okay. So Chief, just for those that might be listening or watch this later, what is a Class C versus what is, what, what's an enhanced you know, infraction or um, crime in this situation that, that would warrant PD jumping in and being involved? Okay, say for, for instance, an, an assault. So there is what, you know, what's called an assault by offensive contact. So maybe there was some, some contact or a mutual combat situation between some people. That would be a citation. But if it's ruled that it was actually an assault or someone was attacked, that's a higher level offense. That's a class A. And for that, a student could be arrested. Mm -hmm. What's the difference between an assault and an attack? Mutual combat and attack. I'm real interested in this topic, so I'd like to know. I understand. So a mutual combat situation, what you normally see is two people who, in a school, when I was in school, two people meet up somewhere after school and they fight. Two people show up and they agree to fight. An assault is when someone is attacked without provocation. That's not mutual. If someone is just walking down a hall and gets punched, that's an attack. That's assault. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. This is anecdotal, and I, I just recently talked to a principal about this issue, and, and they're a principal in a fourth ISD school, and they weren't disparaging any student or family. It was just sort of like your observation of the tension that's happening in schools right now and how it's impacting teachers as well. Right. Um, and it's creating this um, tension throughout the school, and so when things do happen, there is a gray area that is causing the school district to say, you deal with this, and that's falling back on Fort Worth PD, and maybe previously, a few years ago, that wasn't happening before. It was just, it was a very insightful conversation for me as what the role and responsibility of our SROs should be versus what y'all are faced with oftentimes in trying to deal with these really difficult situations in a, on a campus setting. And then the last thing I would say is the, the school leadership sounds like it's a really important factor in how you do your jobs. And I'm sure y'all could tell me stories of, of how your principal or administration supports what you're doing versus when if, if, if you have a, maybe a new principal, new campus, how difficult that can be for your jobs because it sounds like this this law especially is a tussle between the two the school district and the police department in this situation absolutely the the job that our SRO, SROs do is vitally important it's incredibly difficult they're walking a fine line every day about what they can and what they cannot do uh, obviously what tragically happened in Uvalde recently I put it I think it's put the spotlight back on what they do and it's shown more of an appreciation for what they do but I hope it also highlights the difficulty and the very uh, complicated decisions they have to make every single day. One thing a lot of people don't even realize we have or how often it has to be used is our threat assessment and response team. And instead of reading this slide to you, I'm gonna turn it over to one of our um, members of that team and someone who is very impressive uh, highly qualified in what he does, uh, has a heart for the work, and when it comes to threat assessment at schools, he was what I would consider our resident expert, and that's Officer Judd. So our threat assessment team, um, I don't know how aware you are, but over the last five years when I began as a threat assessment uh, response member, uh, we've been seeing an increase in social media and internet, text message, cyberbullying type threats. Um, where a student will make a declaration that they are either intend to shoot up a school, blow up a school, commit some type of attack of violence of a uh, life and death, serious bodily injury nature, uh, which rises to a level of criminality, prompting immediate investigation. What we do on the threat assessment team is we receive those. We're available 24 hours, 365. We receive the information. We make an assessment and coordinate a response to locate the person who made the threat and neutralize it through intervention. Uh, usually that intervention involves, uh, once we locate who uh, actually made the threat, it conducts of a home visit of a school resource officer and a school resource supervisor, along with any other patrol personnel who can assist us. 
We go to the residence. We make contact with the violator. Usually it's a, it is a student at the school. We discuss the violation. I show evidence. Whenever I do this, I show clear and convincing evidence of how I tracked and what I did to determine that it did come from them. And then we discuss uh, intervention plans. If an arrest needs to be made, it is. Uh, we also follow up with a, we all request consent to search of the uh, student's bedroom or any area that they have access, specifically only for weapons. We want to make everyone feel as safe as possible. And we know that students do not always, they're not always honest with us about if they actually have access to, to weapons. We discuss gun safety with parents if there are weapons in the home that the student does not have access to or not, are not in possession of. Uh, appropriate storage of those firearms so they do not have access to them. Sometimes uh, parents' eyes are opened to the fact that just because the gun is in your room doesn't mean the student may not have access to it. We provide those and then we make a referral to Tarrant County Juvenile Services or the Tarrant County uh, District Attorney's Office for filing of charges uh, if necessary. Um, it's been a very successful model. Uh, we have a high success rate, probably 85 to 90 percent of the threats that we receive we do locate and neutralize in this fashion. Sometimes, though, because of the difficulties of navigating the uh, tech space and the technological aspects of tracking through the Internet with privacy laws, and uh, specifically if the threat comes from overseas, which I've seen, then we're unable to locate the actor. And so we have to do the next best thing, which is harden the target. We uh, make notifications to all the staff, to the police personnel, so that we have extra people there to make everybody make sure everybody attending school the next day feels safe. Thank you, sir. I, sorry, Chief. I have a couple questions. Sure. Um, is this, uh, first of all, thank you for doing that. Um, is it a situation where a student will report it to you? Like, how do you gather that information? Is it self-reported by their classmates, like they saw it on their Instagram or whatever? Or yeah. do you, how do you plug that in? We get it from a lot of different methods. Okay. I'd say the most common is it gets reported to 911. Okay. Um, after hours, a parent will usually see something or a student may see something, and they will directly call 911 and say, hey, I don't know if I should report this, or I, I see something that's really concerning to me, but somebody said that they're going to shoot up a high school, and I, I need to report it. That gets funneled through our communications to the school resource unit, and then usually to me. I'm the primary. Um, I have other officers that I've trained in it, but I'm the subject matter expert in it. And so usually it goes to me for assessment and then for response. Is there a distinction between um, and a type of post that says specifically, like, I'm going to go to school X with a bomb or a gun versus um, those the folks that maybe aren't making those overt threats but have clear indications mm -hmm. of some sort of mental illness and or, you know, homicidal um, intent, those warning signs that tragically after each one of these incidents, right, we go back and we look at their social media and, and there's like, oh, well, all the warning signs are here. So is there anything that can be done or anything that we are doing to um, address that more nuanced uh, threat as well? So specifically for me, I know that for any of these, I also do a referral to social services within the campus. I make a recommendation that they speak with a social worker. I work closely on my campus with our intervention specialists. We have two of them. For any of these situations that come up that don't rise to the level of criminality but do rise to the level of concern so that they can receive appropriate intervention. Um, usually that involves with discussion with law enforcement about um, concerns that they may have. Maybe it's being driven by something like bullying. Maybe it's being driven something by isolation. It may be driven by abuse. Um, so we want to make sure that the person who's making these either declarations or these intentions or notifications or just musings, posts, things of a concerning nature, that the root cause of it is addressed before it escalates to an attack. And once we get that referral, we stay and maintain that close contact relationship to try to build rapport with that person to make sure that they never go in that direction again. Um, there is a clear difference between a declaration where somebody says, I'm going to do X, and then somebody just saying, somebody should do this. And we have to make that, and that's part of our assessment process. One last question. Um, uh, I have two young kids in school, and so, um, and I think actually most of us do here. Uh, um, and 
you know, there's that idea of I don't, I don't want to tell, I don't want to be the snitch, I don't want to go and, you know, have all my friends hate me. Um, and I'd like, and I, you probably don't have an answer now, but I'd like maybe an IR or something as we come back. Are there things that other communities do, like um, maybe not Crime Stoppers, that, but that's more in line with how kids communicate these days, whether it be, I don't, I mean, some form of social media or uh, maybe an online portal where they can share that, you know, students feel safe to anonymously maybe share some of that information with y'all. I don't know if we're doing that now, but I'd like to see if, um, if other communities have something kind of innovative for that because I think that's a, a, a worry for me is those folks that aren't maybe making those declarations but yeah. have those tendencies that, I mean, when this happens, everyone kind of looks around and goes, I'm not really surprised that, you know, yeah. something always seemed off with that person. And so to suss that out a little bit. So I think one of the things you talked about when you said those, um, they're not necessarily trusting Crime Stoppers because Crime Stoppers is available in our campus. Um, we do presentations on it. We make sure the information is put out so all students understand how it works. Um, and then overcoming the culture of protectionism um, from one student to another to trust us as adults that we are on their side, that part of that rapport building process that we go through as SROs, letting the kids not only get to know us, but getting to know them and building that trust so that they understand that we're here to help um, is big. One of the things that's come about recently on social media, I'm not sure how many of you are aware of it, but there are lots of anonymous pages on things like TikTok, Instagram, Snapchat, uh, any social media account pretty much has these. And what they are is they're generally run by students or people who are student adjacent, sometimes they're family members, and they pose as an anonymous reposting service for students to basically spill their gossip. And, some, and sometimes, not necessarily all the time, but sometimes these type of declarations and intentional threats come through on those pages. And usually they're reported to us by the, by the person who has the page, because um, usually it's a student that they create a page uh, that doesn't identify who they are, but says, send me all your, your gossip and drama, I'll repost it. Sometimes they'll reach out to me directly and say, hey, I run this page, um, but somebody says something really concerning on here, I need to report it. I've also seen, though, that somebody that ran a page where somebody reported something that uh, somebody made a specific declaration that they were going to shoot up a school, and when it didn't get traction, they reposted it using found imagery from the internet to make it seem worse than it was, even going so far as to put a countdown on it. It sent the entire school in a lockdown, and I was tracking not only two people who had posted, um, but I was also tracking which one was had more veracity and which one was more authentic. Um, so I've seen both. I've seen both really positive behavior from students who say, this looks wrong, I feel in danger, I want to report this. And then I've seen students who are maybe chasing the fame that they're looking for on social media to try to uh, bring some notoriety to themselves have actually escalated a threat beyond something that was an initial mere declaration to now it was a mere declaration with a timeline. That's actually a very insightful question. And I've, I don't have all the data right now, but I've, I have heard of certain apps that students can access and anonym, anonymously make notifications like that. So let us look into that. I would love to get that information back to you. Um, I have a couple of questions. Um, how, can you give us a percentage of how often we're getting threats like this for the schools? I mean, is it 10 times a month, 100? Uh, I'd say that they're going up. I think when I first started, uh, I dealt with about three to five in the first year. Um, but total? I total, yes, in the first year, but that was in 2017, 2018. Um, now, in this last year, I believe we de dealt with 26 threats. Um, so far this school year, since we've been in school uh, since Monday, I've dealt with three. Three. So okay. It's, so, it's escalating and becoming mm -hmm. more common. Sometimes it will go several months without a major threat coming through, and then sometimes they'll come very sequenced in nature where we're, we're seeing maybe some copycat type behavior. I have seen that. And um, so sometimes it just, I haven't found a distinct profile. But I can say overall, it, it does seem to be increasing. That is the trend. And you are currently an SRO at Arlington Heights. High Arlington School. Heights. Yes, I, I transferred to Arlington Heights High School last October when Crowley ISD ended their contract with Fort Worth Police Department to provide school resource officer services to their districts, uh, where I was there for four years before that. Okay, and you're also the lead 
Yes. For this program here. Yes, I do this as a collateral duty. Okay. In addition to my SRO duties. So when we have these major problems or come up, how do you do both? Well, usually these occur after hours, so I respond uh, under our emergency callback procedures. All SROs receive phones. We have take-home vehicles, so we can respond to emergencies on our campus. Um, and I take it upon myself to take on the extra workload of fulfilling this because I'm very passionate about it. So maybe one day you'll work? If I could make this my primary duty, I would. But unfortunately right now, we just don't have the resources to do that. So I do both. As a matter of fact, we had a conversation, uh, had one with uh, Danny Garcia, who you will meet shortly. And one of the things we're determining now in law enforcement is we're having to create spaces, create units, and set aside personnel just to respond to technology advancements, period. Whether that's technology that's occurring around us or technology that's occurring in our department itself, we're having to shift. And this is one of the shifts that's going to have to happen because if we go from three or so in one year to three in a week, the need's great. The need is very great. Were there any other questions before we continue? Oh, Carlos. Uh, yes, sir. And uh, I'll start with uh, you, Officer Jed, on this. You mentioned, uh, and we've been talking about threat assessments, you know, for the most part. But when you look at it, uh, you know, school safety is comprised of several elements. A lot of those elements also include uh, the participation and adherence of uh, school staff, administration, teachers, et cetera, you know, to their own safety protocols, to making sure they um, have their training up to date when it comes to threat assessments, when it comes to lockdowns, so they know exactly what to do, that it's as much second nature as possible. Uh, does Do the SROs, I mean, I, I'm sure you're involved with that in assisting them to make sure that uh, they know what's expected. Yes. You know, of them. But do, do the SROs themselves rank how well they're doing periodically? Rank the, the schools uh, yeah, or the, the schools, faculty and staff? The schools. I yeah. know of no ranking that we've ever done. Uh, also. Ranking, grading, we do uh, periodic some kind review. of feedback. We do periodic review yeah. and assessment. Um, we've done it, habitually we've done it yearly. Um, we've escalated that to now we're going to be doing quarterly reviews mm -hmm. of our safety procedures as far as how we integrate with the campus for their emergency operations plan with the ISDs. Um, if uh, we had a perfect world, we would probably increase our drills, increase our training time so that everyone understands that uh, safety is everyone's priority, that there's a reason behind the re why we have exterior doors remaining locked, why we need to adhere to wearing your badges and IDs at all times, um, complying with lockdown procedures, taking them seriously, uh, ultimately to enhance our protection and prevention. Yeah, I and mean, I totally understand that you got to balance that out too because the primary purpose of school is to educate. Absolutely. And you, know, you can't have too much of an impact in the regard of doing these other ancillary things just mm -hmm. as in response to the times. And Chief, um, just out of curiosity, um, the ISDs in the area, uh, generally, you know, I know some, we talked about Eagle Mountain, Saginaw ISD choosing to go with their own in-house, you know, um, SRO policing, you know, uh, complement. But uh, the larger ISDs, have you seen uh, in, in terms of number of requested SROs, that number to stay the same generally, increase slightly, you know, in light of what's been going on? Maybe you can comment to the, that. The most... As far as requests go, we have made requests, I know, for increased officer numbers at schools because a lot of these districts grow very rapidly along with the city of Fort Worth. And uh, as I said before, we like one SRO per 1,000 students, but we'll go up to 1,500. We've had some schools that have grown rapidly, and for the safety of the, the students, the staff, the faculty, and the officers, we want to make sure we have the correct numbers of officers there. We've had some discussions uh, with some ISDs about potentially increasing, but the actual formal requests for more, no. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. I, sure. I was not truthful when I said it was my last question, but this is easy. If you could just um, provide a list of SROs by council district, like contact information, that would be really helpful, um, I know, to me and probably to the rest of my colleagues uh, so that, you know, we can reach out and y'all can reach us. 
Arlington Heights is District 9, so, um, <laughs> but I'd like to have that same dialogue with my SROs that we're able to have with our MPOs, and they're, they operate a little differently, and so um, we don't, I don't do a good job of that, so if you could get us that information, that'd be really helpful. We'd be more than happy to. Thank you. Thank you for, for wanting the information. All right, we'll move along. Uh, when it comes to, we talked about the law enforcement role of an SRO, as far as the educator role, a lot of it has to do with being guest speakers, and here's the topics that I mentioned we would discuss. Gang deterrence, drug resistance, decision-making, driver safety, bullying. When it comes to our staff, they participate in some of the civilian response to active shooter or events or craze training. They work with them uh, during their staff in-service days, do a lot of tabletop exercises, and I will say this summer, the last count I heard was over 500 faculty and staff from ISDs across the region have come to Fort Worth PD for free training. We've had teachers, we've had other staff members, we've had administrators, and I've spoken with several of those classes and they are absolutely thrilled with the training, blown away with the way it happens, with the, the way it seems so real and actually gives them tools, things they can do to keep themselves and their students safe while we're responding to their location. This just gives a breakdown of some of the numbers of like the anti-bullying drug presentations and so on that SROs take part in during the school year. Pretty big numbers. Informal counselor. Uh, we were talking before these two gentlemen. One of the things we look for when we're looking for SROs is someone that's got the heart for the work. Someone who wants to engage with students, build those relationships, build that trust, and have a positive impact on them. And this is where the mentoring comes in. We want them to be positive role models, a trusted channel of communication, because some students do not have that otherwise, and a source of community resources for whatever the students might need. We've actually, I've talked to several officers on our department who were only on our department because of positive interactions they had with an SRO when they were a student. That's the impact it can have. To show some of the counseling sessions and community connections our SROs have made with uh, students and other family members. When school's out, they still do a lot. Do you think, well, they're just there during school, the school year, they're there during the summer as well, during summer camps, during summer school, but one of the most important parts of their roles during summer comes down to the training. They do the TASRO, which is a Texas Association of School Resource Officers, and NASRO that we discussed earlier. They do the refresher training, they train on alert, I know Officer Judd here is an alert trainer himself, the active shooter training, but they also invest so much in our educators, staff and faculty to make sure that they are as prepared as they can possibly be for whatever they might face. So for the schools that are not covered by the SRO program, that does not mean they're not receiving services from the forward police department. Any emergency situation, we will respond to. And I can tell you now at a school, the only problem you're gonna have is where are we gonna put all the cops that show up? Because we are gonna show up and we will go in. Uh, Non-emergency situations are handled just like we would normally dispatch any call. Emergency situations are a little different. For the schools where we don't have an SRO on campus, our patrol officers are encouraged to go there daily. We actually have a call with a call out on so we can track the number of times an officer, patrol officer goes there. Our NPOs make regular visits to our schools that aren't covered by SROs, as well as our citizens on patrol. They did a great job for the first week of school, and we just talked with those uh, leadership team over our uh, citizens on patrol, our cops, and they're going to be doing that daily now uh, for schools not covered by SROs. Now, these are just some things we, we were asked, what are some school districts doing? We are presenting what school districts are doing, but we're not presenting this because we're recommending it. These are just some of the options we've seen happen with other ISDs. So this is with Burleson. They're actually having private armed security on their campuses where they do not have SROs. Uh, it seems like reaching out to retired police officers, offering, offering a decent salary might be a great way to attract some quality security, highly trained security officers there. That's one thing we're seeing, and that's in Burleson ISD. Something else that's actually been in place since 2013, school marshals and school guardians. So here's the difference. 
School marshals receive more training, 80 hours, and T. Cole is the Texas Commission on Law Enforcement, by the way. They are basically security officers with some law enforcement authority. They receive that training and are assigned to various schools to provide security services. The school guardians, on the other hand, is someone who's already a school employee, maybe a teacher, who receives, I believe, 16 hours of training and is allowed to carry a firearm that's safely secured on school property. The position of the Ford Police Department, the position of the Texas Police Chiefs Association, that is an ISD decision. That is an ISD decision. All we ask is if any school is going to take part in any of these programs, they work closely with us. They make sure the recruiting, vetting, hiring, training is solid and make sure we're included in that process for one thing, to make sure the process is going well. But second of all, the last thing we want to do is respond to a school, see someone with a gun and not realize they have a teacher there that's armed. Oh okay, yeah, a little bit lighter. Um, we have another one of our rock star SROs here, Officer Terrence Parker, and I've asked him to come in here and give us a little taste of what a day in the life of an SRO is like. Well, I can tell you the first thing I do when I wake up is like, what are my lovely kids going to have me do today? So for the most part, get there, get there in the morning, see the kids get off the bus, walk around the campus, high fives here and there, a couple mean mugs, mean mug them back, you know, they they come and greet you in the hallway. Walk around, make sure all the doors are locked once the kids are in class, make sure they go to class, stay out of the bathroom. They love to migrate in the bathroom. I don't know why, but kids love to migrate in the bathroom. Oh, snap. Hey, there we go. Kids love to migrate in the bathroom. I don't know why, but they love to go to the bathroom. Get them out of there, get them in class. Interact with the um, staff, get with the principal, find out what she needs, what's going on today. What needs to happen, you know, anything pressing, any students you need me to talk to, um, anybody you need me to keep an eye on. Uh, found out I'm not as young as I used to be. Tried to play basketball with some of the kids down there in the gym, and they just wore me out. So uh, I got to stop that. I got bad knees. Uh, make sure the campus is secure. Walk around, you know, keep uh, students that have graduated that are not allowed on campus anymore, keep them off campus. Work with uh, campus security. We know, that's with Daniel. I work with campus security that's out there. Just uh, and interact with the kids mostly. A lot of these kids look for someone to talk to. They need someone. They need. Uh, I call my office a safe space for them. If they need to vent, cry, BS, whatever, they can always come talk to me. I tell all my kids. I say, look, whatever we talk about, see, it's between us. It's in here unless I have to take some type of action otherwise. If I have to do something, I have to notify staff, then look, staff needs to know about this. But for the most part, I try to be there for them, try to give them an ear so they can talk, I listen to them, try to solve any and every single problem they have, which seems to be a lot, especially when it comes to social media. All the kids in social media, it's like, oh, they said this about me, they said that about me, and, you know, this person's talking about that, and I'm like, did it hurt you? No. Did it do anything to you? No. It's just words. Keep walking. Ignore it. As hard as it may be. Try not to look, look into it too much. But kids these days, they talk. So and so said this about somebody. So I try to be that mediator in the middle. I look at these kids as my little troops. I'm a military drill sergeant. So I trained you know, kids coming into the military and put them out into, you know, training them to go to war. I take a different approach for these kids. They're my little troops there, but I try to mold them and build them up to be better people within the community. Look forward to something. I ask them, what's your five-year plan? What's your 10-year plan? Um, you know, you're a junior. Where are you going to go? Are you going to college? If you're not going to college, you have a job lined up when you get out of here. I try to help them out to put them on a different path, give us a different light in their eyes, because for the most part, all they see is oh, we're there to arrest them, uh, they're in the office because they're in trouble, or we're, we're picking on them. So I try to give them a different outlook, different approach. 
uh, someone they can talk to? I'd say what stood out the most for, for me, Officer Parker, is I don't know if anyone else noticed, whenever he referred to the students, did you hear what he called them every single time? My kids. My kids. That's the perspective we want. We don't want officers going to schools looking at students as suspects. They are not. They're kids. Next, I'm going to ask another friend. Gentlemen, thank you so much. I appreciate your time very, very much. So many of you may know this young man right here. He retired from Ford PD after 25 years as an assistant chief. A, a wonderful career with the police department. And not everyone is as lucky as he is to go on to another successful career where it seems to me he's just as happy because he's taking care of people. He's doing something important. So I wanted to introduce my good friend here, Danny Garcia, to talk about the partnership between Fort Worth ISD and Fort Worth PD, and he is the Executive Director of Safety and Security at Fort Worth ISD. Thank you, Chief, and uh, good afternoon to everybody. Pleasure to be here today and answer any questions that you might have. But uh, what I kind of wanted to highlight, I know you got a lot of information today from the Chief and his staff, but I, I thought it was important to kind of highlight some of the partnerships that this group may not be necessarily aware of. Because we really are connected, as Chief, Chief and I had an opportunity to speak this, this morning a little bit more in depth about just the different partnerships that we have. But, you know, even, even your, your Fort Worth PD Intel unit, you know, I speak to those folks at least on a monthly basis, you know, through, their, through the information that they gather, the Crime Analyst Fusion Center. There's a lot of information floating around out there that impacts our school district. A lot of it has to do with our school boards and activity and protest and different activity that, that's connected to the school board. So that information is really vital to us because that helps us, number one, not to be caught off guard and to make sure that we're prepared for our school board meetings with the proper amount of police and security so that everybody stays safe, the visitors that are coming to attend those meetings. Um, and also, you know, all of us are very familiar. We got a lot of information today about the school resource officers and what they do. And we're, we're very familiar with the job they do, the officer presence, the arrests, the reports, the mentoring of kids. Officer Parker did a great job explaining that. But, you know, to me, after spending 24, 25 years here in this department and retiring as, as an assistant chief and even the support bureau over the, the school unit, I've learned so much being on the other side. I had it to do over again. There's, there'd be a lot of things I'd do differently. But really, the SROs are also very closely tied in duties to the way they carry out their job at the school of an NPO. Because they really do far more than just make the arrests, make the reports. They help the administrators really resolve really deep community issues as well, like with neighbors. They need a referral to a different department in the city, whether it's TPW, school zones, streets, traffic. I mean, just an array of issues. So if you think about all the duties that an NPO does, the SRO does it too, besides the 101 thing that Officer Judd just explained to you that they do. So they really do perform a great service for us, and we, do, uh, we really do value them and appreciate having them at our schools. And uh, Officer Judd also briefly touched on the response team or the threat assessment team. So I wanted to highlight that this team is available 24 hours a day, seven days a week after normal school hours. So most of the times that we get these threats, these social media threats, they're happening on the weekend, they're happening after hours. So a few years ago, we did not have the ability to really react. We were caught flat-footed when we'd get a social media threat on a Saturday evening. What are we going to do come Monday? Parents want to know. This stuff is floating around. They're seeing it. They're wondering whether we even know about it. And more than likely, they're going to keep, guess what? They're going to keep their kids out of school on Monday because we don't have a plan, right? So in 2018, after the Parkland and Santa Fe shootings, uh, this team came together with the support of the police department, of course. And what that unit really gives us the ability to do is immediately address a threat, social media or otherwise. 
and helps us develop a plan. The officers come out, begin an investigation if need be. It's been really highly successful and uh, made various arrests, like uh, Officer Judd explained, weapons confiscated, suspects identified. Um, you know, a few times it was just meant to be a joke. But when you have an officer or officers at your parents' door at 10 o'clock at night, they find out it's not a joke, that it's being taken serious and it, that, it, that it is being addressed. So that's been a tremendous help to us because parents want to know three things in these situations when we have uh, social media threats or otherwise. They want to know that we're aware of the threat, number one. They want to know that police is involved and that we're working with them to address it. And they want to be sure that there is a safety plan in place for Monday come school time. And so with this after hours response team, we're able to do all those three things. So that really helps us because as you can imagine, school attendance really is devastated when these threats come in, especially over the weekend. And, and rightfully so as a parent, you know, most of us here are parents and we can definitely identify with not feeling safe about that. But if you get a communication, we're able to communicate with our parents and say, hey, we're doing all these things. We're aware of the threat. Police is involved. They're investigating. And guess what? We have a good, solid safety plan for your kids on Monday. Please send them to school. They're going to be safe. Right. So that's the message that we want to send. Um, the real time crime center. Obviously, Fort Worth PD has an extensive camera system throughout the city. Uh, many times they capture data and information that is relevant to the safety of our schools. They share that. Uh, the, police, the school district also has an extensive camera system. There's hardly a week that goes by that there isn't an, an officer or detective in my office recovering video from, from a school camera where a crime has been committed. And so that assists them with their investigation. It was a couple of years ago where one of our cameras actually caught a, a homicide that one of our school cameras uh, captured. And, uh, and of course, we have a MOU in place between both organizations that gives Fort Worth Police uh, the power to access school district cameras. So you say, well, how is that going to be helpful? Well, in an emergency situation, if your real-time crime center officers are able to access our cameras, then guess what? That emergency response is going to be enhanced. They're going to be able to send the troops, the officers, where, they need, where they're needed most. And uh, so we think that is a really big plus for all of us in the district and, and uh, within the city. Uh, and then going down to, to the patrol support. Uh, what I tell all my principals is every one of your schools is, within, is on a beat. It's within a police division somewhere in the city of Fort Worth. So get to know your patrol officers. Get to know your beat officers. Get to know your commander. You know, because when you call 911, these are the officers that are coming. Yes, your SROs may be there. They may be out of pocket. They may be down at juvenile processing an arrest, whatever. But when that emergency happens, it's important that you have that relationship with your divisional police staff. And they, they know your staff and they know who you are. They know what your school looks like, the layout of the school. All that is going to greatly enhance when there is an emergency and they do have to respond to your school and actually know how to get around. And the fact is, um, the commanders want to get to know them and they want information from the school principals and the administrators. They want to know, when are you having problems? Is it at lunch when kids go off campus and at our secondary schools, uh, high schools? Is it after school? Are you having fights at certain, you know, community centers or what have you? And then the commanders can go back and they can incorporate that information into their crime fighting strategies. So all the way around, getting to know each other, building relationship is going to have a positive influence on all that. And then the last item on here, again, going back to the active shooter training. So... As you know, this summer, the police department developed a very specific active shooter training, specially focused for teachers and for school staff. So they, they opened that up this summer. Uh, I know there was hundreds of Fort Worth ISD personnel that went through, and we're currently coordinating with the uh, police academy to uh, identify some dates that we can send 
all of our staff through there. And, I, and not, just, not just teachers, but teachers, principals, custodians, you name it. All of them will surely uh, uh, benefit from the training. The better trained they are, the better they're going to be prepared during an emergency. Question, so, yes. Daniel, thank you for this. And I hate to bring up such a difficult subject, but I think it's really impetus for why we're talking about this today, what happened in Uvalde. Mm -hmm. As professionals that have been doing this for a very long time, if you look now that can, you can look at two different reports in the Senate and the House, DPS reports, lots of news reporting, how did you evaluate what you already had in place and make changes for our students and families here in Fort Worth? Um, and then importantly, yeah. where were you really proud that you already had different safety nets in place that maybe were not there in Uvalde? Yeah, no, that is a great question because that's the first thing that I did. I'm sure Chief was doing the same things. And luckily for us, there really wasn't anything that I would change, really, other than I, I guess our, our focus on making sure all our safety-related equipment was in better operating conditions, our cameras, our access control, our doors. And of course, we were we were mandated this summer to conduct a partial summer safety audit, an exterior door audit, access control. So I think, if anything, I think we needed to tighten that up. But as a, but as far as the way we communicate and the way we would respond to an emergency, you know, that's pretty tight. Yes. I'd have to say. Agreed. And uh, so, fortunately for what for us, there was not a lot of things that needed to be changed. Uh, there was uh, Assistant Chief Sparrow and um, one of the uh, training officers down at the academy, uh, Officer Sean Harris, came and addressed our safety and security committee a few weeks ago. And the reason I brought him over is I wanted to put our school board members at ease, basically saying what happened there would not happen here. And this is why. And uh, they did a great job explaining that and uh, explaining the emergency response procedures from the police department and how they would have handled a similar situation, how they train, how they prepare. And uh, so all that to say, I think we're in very, very good shape. Yeah. And Chief, I think I was on a previous slide just recently. You talked about the other officers that are paying visits, especially to maybe our elementary campuses where there are not SROs. Is that a recent change or is that something that you were already doing previous to what happened in Uvalde? That's something we were already doing, but we're enhancing. Okay. And one of the enhancements is the, uh, the call sign, so we're tracking it, and the uh, Code Blue members being a part of it. And we don't necessarily expect them to be the ones to engage a shooter, but they are our eyes and ears so frequently and having that deterrent effect with anyone watching sometimes is all it takes. But we're making sure, again, not just MPOs and patrol officers, but anyone else in either specialized units or in the area or stopping by schools and being a very visible presence. Thank you. Yeah. And, and, and one other thing that you guys may not know about, but, and it just happened recently. So we have security staff basically in all our schools, and we have a position called campus monitors. And... I guess the way I would explain that position in a nutshell is that they're kind of like paid code blue, eyes and ears for the school in regard, but they're totally focused on safety issues. So we actually had 33 elementaries that didn't have this position or any safety staff, and that has now been approved by our board. So we're working hard you know, now to, to fill all those positions. So the good news is at least there is some form of safety and security staff at every, or will be at every single school within Fort Worth ISD. And, and even after hours. So we use about 150 police officers that we hire on a part-time hourly basis. And we use, most of which are Fort Worth officers, and we use those to staff and secure all our athletic events after hours and our special events. So that's, that's another thing that everybody may not necessarily know or think about. Thank you. I think Chris and uh, this whole row had a question, so yeah. just go on down. Uh, thank you. First, I want to say thank you uh, for being here. Thank you for what you do. Sure. And I, I, I do have a concern, and, um, and I'll kind of explain it to you. Uh, I think the mayor had a good question uh, when she asked, uh, after evaluating our measures versus other measures, um, and I'm sure there are some things that have changed because you just studied, stated that you provided 
uh, staff into the elementary schools. Right. But when you say that I think we're good, no major changes need to take place, that's kind of scary because there's always room for improvement. True. And, and I want to make sure that we do our due diligence to check again. And one of the questions I have with you is for our security. Um, I think some of the issues with the shooting and other shootings was it was a staff issue or staff didn't shut the door. We don't know the, all of, all what happened, but maybe left the door propped open, X, Y, and Z. So have your office, uh, do you guys do annual trainings for the teachers to provide security measures for them you know, you don't leave the door propped open. You make sure the door shuts mm-hmm. behind you. If there is a door jam or uh, whatever, do you do annual training for school teachers? Do y'all send out emails or reminders or to make sure to help keep things safe? Mm-hmm. I mean, you did a, a walkthrough, but things happen along the way right. for year out. No, you're exactly right, and uh, you're 100% correct. Uh, I think the way I was ch- trying to come across, I wasn't trying to come across to say, we're perfect. We don't need to do anything. You're exactly right. We can always do better and should do better. Um, and uh, so in regard to training our staff, yes, we do. We uh, meet with them as often as, as possible. You know, um, part of the mission of, of uh, my department is uh, for our staff to provide some of that training. But we also rely heavily on our SROs to provide a lot of that training. And I think you saw some of that. Uh, they uh, they work with uh, with our administrators and our school staff, and uh, and actually, uh, so a couple of of things were already in the works before Uvalde even happened, and uh, this school year we launched a new mass emergency notification system, which it we didn't do that because of Uvalde. It was already in the works. Obviously, it takes a couple of years to even appropriate that kind of uh, new technology. But it's just another tool. It's not anything that's going to totally solve all our problems, but it gives administrators and school staff another tool to be able to communicate with each other during an emergency, which that's one of the challenges that we have during an emergency is communicating. You want to send a message to as many people as possible in the shortest amount of time. And this new technology, which can be launched from a computer at the school, a phone at the school, over the PA systems, over the digital displays, on a phone app, in case the principal is away from from campus, he or she will know that something's going on, their school's on a lockdown, on a hold, on a secure, whatever the case might be. So, you know, we're constantly looking at trying to make enhancements like that. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah, I just wanted to get your opinion uh, about... um, I think it was the Dallas ISD, and there may have been a couple others that are requiring the clear backpacks. Clear bags. Yeah. But what What do you think about that? And, you know, there's a lot of pros about. and cons. I I don't necessarily think it's a bad idea. I mean, uh, again, so many of the things that we do, it's not a silver bullet, right? Clear bags isn't going to solve all of Dallas' problems, but it's another tool. So. I think you have to, it's hard to make a generic, say, hey, I think it's a great idea, I think it's a bad idea. It's really upon the individual district. Is it something that will benefit that district? So just to answer your question, I think it's a good tool. Mm -hmm. I think it would be a good tool for that district. It's twice the size of ours, you know, anything that, any any other mechanism that can help. There's always a, a way around it. Even a clear bag, you can put other things to Sure. You know, where you can't see, and, um, you know, there, there is other issues that, that that maybe somebody may not like that idea because of that, but I don't necessarily think it's a bad idea. Okay, mm-hmm. something that you all creatively may have discussed or thought Right, about. right, and, and it's just like, um, for instance, this school year, we're uh, mandating that the kids in the secondary schools, middle schools and high schools, wear ID badges, so that's something that we had not done district-wide uh, before. So uh, so that's just another enhancement there. And we're kind of rolling it out, just very not being restrictive, not, not turning, it, turning it into a discipline issue in any way, but just trying to send a message to the parents and the kids that we're doing it for safety. 
we need to know who's on our campus, who belongs on our campus. Having everybody wear an ID makes the job a little bit easier for our security staff to readily be able to identify, hey, you don't belong, or sure. why don't you have a badge? Sure. You know, and yeah. as you all are thinking about your strategies and plans, mm -hmm. um, do you put it in in a context of um, reactionary, which I feel like is a lot of what we've heard today and mm -hmm. and what we see there, versus preventative, right? right? And it, do you look at the uh, the threat or the fear of, of uh, an incident in that way and strategies of course we've seen reactionary strategies but the preventative strategies the backpack is one mm -hmm. are there are there others and because I, I just to give you a sense where I'm coming from is mm -hmm. you know as a parent and there's many around the table and in, in the room and listening um, the reactionary stuff we have to do, and it's great to know what's mm -hmm. what uh, you're planning, but a shot has been fired, right? And you may be the unlucky one, mm -hmm. right? And so sure. that's the that's just it's such an incredible fear. So what what are we doing to hopefully prevent that from happening? Well, and and I think our SROs really help us a lot in that area because they're a big piece of making the kids feel safe. They really get to know their SROs, and uh, and really our administrators do a good job as well. You know, most nine times out of 10, um, the students, from what I've seen, feel very comfortable coming forward with information and sharing that information. You know, the, you know some, of the, some of the things that we promote, like see something, say something, you know, those kind of trying to build that culture of, Hey, if you've got information related to safety or otherwise, it's going to harm anybody. Let somebody know. And uh, so it's been my experience that uh, if a student doesn't directly tell an SRO or a teacher or a school staff member, you know, they'll tell a parent. Uh, again, Crime Stoppers has been very effective. Friends for Life, which is another uh, program within Crime Stoppers that kind of opens it up to any subject at all. That's been very helpful and successful. And uh, the Fort Worth officer that runs that program, uh, Paula Gibson, she comes out to all our schools and does presentations to, to the staff about the importance of reporting anything that may be a danger to themselves personally or to the school. So there's a combination of things going on in, to, to address that. Mm -hmm. So I, I was curious, you talked about the, um, the school monitors, and then earlier in the presentation, um, there were some trainings that were specific to our SROs. Now, I understand those are probably law enforcement courses, but do the monitors, is there the opportunity for those school monitors to receive, a, if not that training that the right. SROs receive, some sort of similar training? While they don't act as an SRO, they have that knowledge base and ability. Right. They, and uh, those staff members don't receive anything formal through the police department, but we train them ourselves internally. Okay. Yeah. And one thing that's great about the relationship and the partnership is if any point it was determined we could be of assistance, we would definitely be willing to work mm -hmm. with uh, any ISD on training any staff member mm -hmm. they may have. And with this new uh, active shooter training for school staff that has just been developed, we'll send our campus monitors to that. So we will take full advantage of that. Yes, uh, Daniel, a question for you, follow-up to what mm -hmm. uh, the Councilwoman Vic mentioned about the monitors. Not all Fort Worth ISD campuses have monitors, correct? Not yet, but they're fixing to. Are they? Yeah. Okay, the like I just stated, we okay. the school board approved for all schools to have them. Okay, good. And is that at elementary and middle school included? Yes, sir. Okay, and high schools, I guess. Too. Oh, yeah, well, they already uh, have them. They have several. They have multiple. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay, thank uh, you. You bet. I think we're good. Thanks, Chief. All right, you bet. Thank you. Oh, sorry, Alan. Go ahead. Oh, good to see you. <laughs> so, oh. Chief, thank you. Yes, sir. Um, so during the course of the presentation, now I was uh, reached out to by the superintendent of Keller ISD, uh, wanting to uh, get with your staff and uh, maybe change the narrative from the question that Councilmember Nettles asked you earlier. 
And uh, I think they're going to be reaching out asking for more SRO at their middle schools. Uh, I'd like for you to just take a moment. I appreciate everything you've done. Uh, and, and we've had conversations with Keller ISD. And uh, yeah. Yeah, no. <laughs> That's a different discussion for another day, I think. <laughs> but. Um, could you just take a brief moment and, and uh, express for the public where we are with Keller ISD and where you'd like to be? Absolutely. Uh, we value our relationship with Keller ISD just like we do all of our ISDs. Uh, we value our relationship with Dr. Westfall and his staff, the school board members, and everyone else who has a genuine vested interest in the safety of the campuses, the students, the faculty and staff in Keller ISD. And as we have said before and had a recent meeting about, and I thank you for calling that meeting, council member, we are willing to work with any ISD when it comes to staffing, when it comes to increased staffing. Obviously, there will be conversations that need to be had with this group, with the city manager's office, but we are more than willing to work with ISDs when it comes to providing the appropriate number of SROs in their schools based on their budgeting and their needs. Yes, sir. What, what uh, question were you referring to that I asked? You had asked earlier if any districts had uh, pushed for increasing their staffing oh, in SROs. Outside of today? Outside of today. Oh, okay. Okay, so the next step for uh, the process, there is an MNC that's scheduled to be voted on on September 13th authorizing FY23 school resource officer contracts. Uh, one thing I want to just close with, and before I take any final questions, as the mayor so eloquently stated, Uvalde is the reason a lot of these conversations are occurring. There were already things going on with the department, not because of me, but some really smart people in the department to actually improve our breaching tools, which we're now working to provide to all officers. We think we have about 500 of these improved breaching tools, one of which, which I got to use during some training recently. We have training going on with our officers. We have training going on with our schools. But what I want you to know maybe is the most important thing of all is we have officers who are empowered to make decisions in emergency situations. And all training for years when it comes to responding to active shooter training said you do not wait for an order. You arrive on scene. There is an active threat that is your order, and you will go in alone if necessary. And I'm telling you right now, that's what Fort Worth PD will do, God forbid, if we're ever presented with such a situation. I'd be happy to take any other questions. Any questions for Chief Noakes? Thank you. Thank you very much, Chief. We appreciate you. Thank you, Chief. Is everybody ready for the last presentation? One more. Who wants to talk about affordability of community centers? I'd like to. He's there. He's there. Oh, uh, David, I, Vic, I, I yeah. have to leave, but I do want to leave a couple of questions about this on the table. <clears throat> if you all still have a quorum when I leave since Jared's gone. He's still here. Well, he's not here. Uh, what uh, the, the two qu the questions that I want to raise are how we handle mobile recreation summer day, which is funded by the Rainwater Foundation, compared to Como summer camp day, summer day camp. I should have mentioned this to you, but the question was raised specifically Lions Heart, which does not have benefit of a foundation, and if you get money from a foundation, somebody has to apply for it. And you know what what would happen, or how could we address getting the same kind of treatment at a Como summer day camp? I know a few people in Como, so that's it. And I'll let you take it up from there. Yeah. And, okay, well, I don't, and even if you have to leave, these gentlemen are going to address that. Yeah. And and Michael is going to handle it. Yes. Okay. We have Victor Turner and Dave Lewis. Take it away, guys. Okay, I'll start off. Good afternoon, Mayor Council. Good afternoon. We'll be as brief as we can, as long as necessary. Uh, I think that question did come up about affordability of community center programs, but we're just focused on, two, the after-school program and summer day camp. 
uh, be the focus of our presentation. So some of the objectives that we look at as part of the program is capacity, of course, uh, and that'll be one of the slides, the after school po program, summer day camp, financial assistance, current underwriting opportunities. I think that'll touch on what Councilmember Bivens talked about and then a, a brief summary. Uh, as with any program, transportation is an issue. We do have uh, vans with the uh, Neighborhood Services Program part, uh, uh, rents vehicles for transportation. Uh, the facility size, uh, obviously, is an issue that we have to take into account for the number of kids that are there. Uh, we have an exemption for uh, it being a licensed child care facility. And then, of course, ratios, having the proper number of, of staff and students. As you can see, the program is Monday through Friday with dismissal at 6 o'clock. We do offer discounts for uh, families that have more than one child in the program, and also there's an employee discount. Uh, you can see the fees for uh, without transportation and with transportation. So you do see a difference there, but we have already um, have plans to put in place to uh, uh, level those two between part and neighborhood services so it would be the same fee uh, regardless of what center you go to and what department is uh, administering that after-school program, uh, effective January 1st. So you'll see the impact there uh, as far as revenue. I believe uh, the 21-22 school year, we had 767 students that participated, uh, generated a little over $330,000 uh, in fees. Uh, Victor, do you know what the fee will be? If it's going to be the same, it will be the 40 or will it be the uh, one? It'll drop down to the neighborhood services rate, the okay. 30 uh, without transportation and 40 with transportation for both, both departments. So we did some benchmarking. You can see how we compare with some of the other programs, other cities, and then local programs in Fort Worth. Um, we're in the bottom half as far as uh, rate, so it's... Uh, fairly affordable uh, in comparison to uh, other options uh, locally and around the state. Here you can see our capacity. We were not um, maxed out in regards to capacity. Uh, you can see this is for 18 sites. It would have been 19, but Northside Community Center was closed due to construction. Uh, so over a nine-month period, you can see monthly capacity is almost 1,000. And uh, we served uh, 830 uh, individuals um, this past school year. At the bottom is a breakdown between neighborhood services and part. And that difference is mainly because there are more centers uh, operated by park and recreation than neighborhood services. Victor, can I stop you for just a second to get sure. a clarification? What's the difference between monthly capacity total capa and total capacity? Yeah, so if you take that monthly capacity and multiply it by the nine so, months, you'll get to this. So that's like the annual, so Because to speak. they pay monthly, we just want to put what the monthly capacity okay. is. Awesome. So some kids don't, we're not every month, so okay. I may not go. So we're like a three, about 3,000. We have capacity for about 3,000 more. Yeah, and we expect these numbers to grow. This is still post-COVID where kids are just coming back to joining these programs. We expect to be in a 75 to 80% range next year. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So I believe next is coming up summer day camp. Yeah. You're going to have to control the minds off. Um, I got you. Moving on into summer day camp, and some of the questions we've had on this, I think we've um, answered it on this slide. You can see the base rate without field trips is $60. This is nine weeks, Monday through Friday, 7 a.m. to 6 p.m. It includes a meal, and it's about 52 and a half hours of programming per week on this. So the base fee, five days a week, is $60. We charge an extra $25 to go on the field trips. Averages out to a little over a dollar an hour for that. With fee assistance, you can see it goes down $25. Um, on the base rate, we don't currently offer fee assistance for the trips. I know that was one of the questions that we're addressing here. Another question was why are we having them pay ahead of time when not everybody can afford either the 475 or 315 ahead? We provide an opportunity to pay ahead of time, but you don't necessarily have to pay for the entire summer at one point. Um, again, if you just took nine weeks times 60, that would give you the $540. We give a discount to 475 if you are able to pay it once, but you can pay it once and get a scholarship, so it would be $315 per child if you can pay all at once. We just require a $60 deposit and then essentially pay in full before the camp season starts. We do also offer a 10% multi-child discount 
and a 10% employee discount. So you technically could get the 315 and then minus 10% as well if you have multiple kids that are attending the camp as well. Do you have any idea, you don't have to tell me today, but I'm just curious if there's probably a, um, a price hindrance for families, especially if they do want to go on the field trip. We don't offer a scholarship. I would love to know citywide what the gap might be on average per summer, because I would venture to tell you some of our foundations in town would be more than happy to fill that gap if we could tell them a number. Yeah, we, we okay. have a, another scenario that we haven't necessarily made a formal proposal to do that, but it could be that we offer scholarships. Great. And if just for instance, if we offered scholarship down to even $10 per child on field trips, that would the revenue decrease on that would be about $17,000. Okay. So that was a good question, Mary. My other question to add to that, if they do not attend the field trip, are they not, are they not allowed to go to the camp that day? No, or they, there... they still do go to camp that day. They just don't go on the trip. They go to the center, but not. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. They're still programming at the center. Again, talking about the benchmarking, when we do our fall benchmarking for all of the fees within the department, we always try to strive to be right in the median um, you can see this is pretty much right in the middle. Some of those fees do include camps within it, and it's hard to break it out. Each scenario is slightly different, but again, we strive to be in the middle, and that's pretty much right where we are. A little bit about the summer camp data. Again, 18 sites for nine weeks. Again, the weekly capacity, because we have them pay weekly, we have spots for 1,545 kids each week. The total capacity, if you times that by nine for the entire summer, is just under 14,000. Last year in 22, we had 11,600, 83% capacity on that, and we served 1,671 individual unique kids over summer. And you can see that's an important number as we get into some of the other data down the road here. Um, and looking at the budgets, you can see broken down by department that, you know, in total, the revenue brought in was $627,000 with the estimated expenditures because they're not all calculated yet for this summer. This is just over or just around $565,000. We do have a cost recovery philosophy for camps to cost recover at 100% to pay for those and not subsidize those. That's currently, it's obviously a policy decision, but that's where we are right now. And then moving on into the field trips, the fee, as I mentioned before, is $25 a week. Destinations such as Six Flags, Epic Waters, Fort Worth Zoo, some of our own pools, transportation is included in that. As I referenced earlier, there were 1,671 unique campers this summer. 1,390 of them went on a camp at least once during the summer. Again, right around 83% went on a camp or on a trip at least once. Talking a little bit about the fee assistance eligibility, these are all the programs that families are, are able to show as proof of being a part of to enact that scholarship. The free and reduced lunch is the top one, the most common scene. You just need to bring proof from a school. They have documentation for that that they apply. Fee assistance data, currently in the Park Department, we have a $75,000 cap on the scholarships. We're actually proposing to just remove the caps. Even though we don't get to the cap, um, in the interest of being affordable and not limiting access, both departments are talking about just not even having a cap at all, even though they were under it. Um, again, with that 1,671 individuals served, 508 used fee assistance. So about 30% that go to camp are using a scholarship to do it. The interesting stat on that is, of the total registrations that we saw for camp, about 50% of those are on scholarships. So 30% of the people are taking up 50% of the spots, which means people on scholarship are going more frequently than those that aren't on scholarship. Talked a little bit about earlier about the underwriting opportunities. These are some opportunities that are happening currently. The Rainwater Foundation is funding the swim lesson portion of the mobile recreation program that happens in four sites. They also use neighboring parks on Fridays as kind of their mini field trips. Como Summer Day Camp is also getting funds from Lion's Heart that pays for those field trips and makes that no cost to the families. We do have a program, donations are accepted for a send a kid to camp. It's not widely and proactively promoted, but that is an opportunity as well. Currently it's used to get those who do not, do not, are not eligible for scholarships to get them to the scholarship level. It's not used to waive fees at this point, but it could be used in a number of ways if, if it was desired. Real quick, some of the takeaways. We talked about the after school programs at 61% capacity. We expect that to grow to 75 or 80%. We have a plan to align fees for the same programs. We don't want there to be fee differences based on what center that you go to. We've talked about that. 
Um, summer day camp is at 84 capacity in 22. It's actually 83% of the registrants went on at least field trip. Summer day camp, 30% received fee assistance, and I also mentioned that about 50% of the total registrations come from those 30% of unique participants. Any questions? Well, I think we all have questions. About, go, Elizabeth, go ahead. Um, <clears throat> the after-school program, uh, is there any for like scholarship, the need for scholarships? So I heard, I just want to make sure I heard you say that we still have capacity to provide some scholarships, correct? Correct. Yeah, the 75000 and the 40000 we showed for department only applies to camps. We actually don't have a cap when it comes to the after-school program. So those are those can be Correct. as many Correct. scholarship. And then, um, and so for the camps, we're also not at capacity for those, right? Like we still have additional. Yeah, there are scholarships too. that are not being used from a funding perspective and actual capacity in the camp as well. Okay. Uh, I will say... I, my children went to both um, fire station after school camp and their summer camp, and it was great. And I lived in the neighborhood several years before I even knew it existed. And when I found out how cheap it was, I was like, why am I paying for all of these camps when, you know, the city of Fort Worth has something that was really great and really reasonable? Um, and so I tell you that kind of anecdote to say that I think that we can do a better job at advertising this particular camp. Uh, this program and the cost associated with it because, I mean, I I was floored. And it was it, such a great opportunity because they're community centers, they're local. You know, they, they're in your neighborhood. You're not driving across town to drop them off at whatever the 27 different camps we sign them up for every summer. And so um, I think maybe it would be behoove us to, to do a, a more targeted campaign maybe with the um, schools or neighborhoods. Thank you. Michael. Well, just echoing that, um, you know, I, I'm glad. I, I think I started this conversation just not understanding the difference between the community centers that we have. But I, I want to say, I put the focus again and kind of what Mayor is saying, but also echoing what, somewhat of what Elizabeth said. Um, the people that are using these are the people that can't afford really the camps to, to send their kids to all these camps. Um, they can't send them to Camp Longhorn or name your 700 camps that you can do it, that this is really, for the most part, their lifeline to be able to continue to have their job, especially during the summer or after school, et cetera. So they need a place for their kids to go. So I want us to continue to look at this. And I don't think, and that's what it was brought to my attention too, I don't think it's fair that some kids get to have to stay and some don't go on the 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 field trips that the kids get to do. So whatever that looks like, and I'm glad you asked that question, I think that if the foundations knew about it or other people or other organizations, they're willing to step up to make sure that no kid gets left behind, if you want to use that terminology. And I think one option might be for you and staff to explore on both sides is what would it look like to have just an opt-out? So everyone goes on a field trip. This is the cost. And for families might need to opt out for a variety of reasons. A certain trip is just not something that they want their children to go on. And then what is the gap based on our costs that we think we would incur by creating that model and trying that next summer? And then my second request would be a longer-term conversation. There are a few camps in Fort Worth that I know my kids have really enjoyed. One in particular is Zoo Camp. Another one is Museum of Science and History has traditionally done camps. These are just two small examples. There are others. Is there is there a potential to do maybe not just a pilot next summer with some of these camps in partnership with the zoo to do a zoo camp integrated with their model, but there would be kids that are on our cost model for sure. um, Fort Worth camps. Yeah. Um, and I'm sure the zoo would be more than happy to explore that option for us. And there's a still, I consider affordable, but um, they have a gap in care, especially in the afternoons for younger kids. Sure. So Yeah, that's a great idea. We'd love to explore that. I just, can I, I want to address something Michael said Um I think you're right that the affordability absolutely makes it a lifeline for some people. Um, I also think that there's a lot of folks, particularly like the Fire Station Community Center, where Fairmount really sends it all of their children, right? Like there's a good majority of kids from the neighborhood that go there. Um, and so I think we've already captured those the folks that need us because uh, they probably sought us out. But the, the people that haven't um, are kind of who I feel like we should be also letting know because it's not just a it's it 
for me, it wasn't a last resort. It really was one of the best summer camp experiences that my kids had. Sans the broken arm, but that wasn't the community center's fault. That was my kids' fault. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, interesting enough, uh, fire station is actually the lowest percentage of scholarship participants, it's like 7%. Um, but to address your point earlier, one of the things we thought about was just having it, it's a fee for the week that includes the camp. Even the perception's a little bit different if you're adding on to it, where if that's just the base fee, the perception is different. So that may be something that we look at as well, where you could say, I don't really want to go to X field trip, so there may be a chance to reduce that and opt out rather than opt in. Right. Okay. Thank you. This is great. Thank you, gentlemen, very much. Thank you. Appreciate it. Victor is a man of few words today. All the time. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, guys. That wraps up the presentations for today. I will refer that there are a number of budget responses that are also in your material. Uh, we are also available anytime after this meeting and before our next budget work session, which is sometime in September, that if anybody has any questions, we don't have any further presentations planned as part of the budget process. So if there are any need for any presentations or questions of uh, getting additional information, just let us know. How, how many more budget cycles are we look, uh, meeting sessions are we looking there are at? There two scheduled in September. Okay. I can't remember the dates offhand. And if you can just give us a, hit, a heads up on when we're going to bring fire back so we can be really prepared okay. for that. Yeah. And that they have adequate time to deal with us. <laughs> All right. All right. <laughs> Perfect. Any other questions, Council? Nope. Okay. Meeting adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>